Members of a quorum, I call the Acton Boxborough Regional School Committee to order. This meeting is being conducted remotely via Zoom webinar per our remote participation policy, BEDJA. The following 10 members are in attendance via Zoom, Evelyn Abaya Issa, Kira Cook, Adam Klein, Jenny Kremer, Amy Christian Murphy, John Peterson, Nora Shine, Angie So, Yevon Wang, and myself. Diane Baum is expected to join us a little later. Public participation is possible via the Zoom link or call in phone number. Our school committee meetings are also live streamed on Acton TV's YouTube channel, although public participation is not possible with that option. The links and phone number are found on the posted agenda on the abschools.org calendar. This meeting is also being recorded and will be posted on Acton TV's website at actontv.org. Per our remote policy, all votes will be done by roll call. I will call each member's name and they will state how they vote. And according to John, I am very lucky that there are not a hundred of us as there are in the Senate and that I should be very grateful that I only have to call on 10 other people for a roll call vote. So <laughs> we'll all keep that in, 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 in our thoughts tonight. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we are really lucky tonight to have our uh, student uh, council representative join us, Rick Mazumder. Um, would you like to give your update? Yeah, sure. Um, okay. So today I want to just update everyone on my, me and my peers' opinions on the hybrid schedule and for the brief period that we went remote which I believe took place between, on the, between the days of December 20th and December 22nd. So uh, me and my peers have spent pretty much most of the year in the hybrid schedule. And we decided to weigh the benefits and the downsides of the schedule and compare it to that week and a half in which we went remote. So I'm gonna start about talking about with the hybrid schedule. I'm gonna talk about the benefits and the downsides. So. What me and my peers really like about the hybrid schedule is it's much easier to learn in school than it is over Zoom. With the teachers sitting there, you all you can immediately ask any questions you have, and you can also ask any clarifying questions you have, which is much easier when compared to the remote schedule, where it draws a lot more attention on you if you try to ask questions, which a lot of people don't like to have. Along with that, it's much easier for teachers to administer tests, and there's less of a hassle to print out tests and annotate on Cami. There's so much less hassle when you're taking a test in school. Furthermore, I would say the biggest benefit of the hybrid schedule is that we can interact with our friends and peers. This is something we cannot do at all over the remote schedule. And this is a really important feature of school that we still enjoy having. Because to, without it, school pretty much becomes a monotonous mess of just going there, taking tests, and coming home. This interaction, like this human man person to person interaction with our friends and teachers, really makes it different and makes us feel much better about being in school. Along with that, it's also nice to have an asynchronous break, so we don't always have to wake up at 7 a.m. every morning. A day, a day on our own allows us to prep and get some sleep in when we definitely need it. Some of the downsides, though, are there's more there's more testing with less teaching. So already in the previous schedule, the teachers had to test us a lot in order to keep up with the curriculum. But now since we're spending even less days at school and less days learning with the teachers, we have to spend more time getting tests done because we just have to do this. So it's a higher test to learning ratios. Along with that, we see teachers less frequently because of the fact that we're only seeing them twice a week and we're really just watching videos for the rest of the week. And along with that, there's a low COVID schedule. There's like a low COVID risk. Now, as for the remote schedule. This was actually an okay period, but we wouldn't really long, like it long term. Even though it's more consistent and we get to see the teachers more with no risk of COVID whatsoever, we have to wake up early day and we have to we have to work up early every day. We have to sit in front of a screen for the whole day, which is not only mentally straining for us, but it's like, it's, it's just, it's not healthy to sit in front of a screen for six hours a day. And along with that, it's much harder to learn from home and administer tests from home because we have distractions uh, like our parents working in the same building, like working just in the room next to us, or our pets just going back and forth. And it's really hard to administer tests like this when there's so many different distractions and all these different tech issues. Um, my final point that I had with the remote schedule was that we had a really weird schedule. Because of the remote schedule, um, our school tried to, we tried to get back to the drop schedule that we had last year, in which we dropped one class per day. However, this led to some really weird schedules. For example, one day I had a class, I had a school day where I had to wake up at eight to do my first class. But then the next class I had started at one, which was really weird. 
So overall, we thought that each of these hybrid and remote schedules had their own benefits. But for the most part, we agree that this hybrid schedule was better for us as a person because of the fact we don't have to sit in front of a screen for six hours at a time. And we get that social aspect, which you can get when we're going remote. So this is just our update and our opinions about this issue. Thank you, Rick. It's extraordinarily wonderful and helpful to hear directly from students. And uh, even though many of us have our own students, it's really nice to hear the perspective, especially of the high school students, because I know that the, the schedules have been really different and changing. And you know, we all know maybe how our own kids reacted to those, but it, it's nice to hear uh, how a larger group did. Did anyone else have any questions for Rick? It looks like our, it looks like there's an attendee that has a question. I think I'm not sure. Uh, I think that's probably for public participation. Okay, Evelyn. Oh yeah, just something short. I just wanted to thank Rick for sharing his feedback on the schedule. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to me. Oh, it's even so more helpful on my screen when your hand goes up. It shows up in your little box. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> that's exciting. All right, so Evelyn, will you put your hand down now so that I can see that it's gone? Okay, there's a learning camp there. Okay, there's all a, right. <laughs> you did it. Okay, yeah, excellent. Um, Rick, that was really helpful. Thank you so much for coming and, and gathering everybody's perspectives, and we look forward to hearing your next update. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Rick. Thanks. All right, so per policy VEDH, members of the public may speak for up to three minutes on items that are not included on this agenda. Comments regarding items on the agenda should be made during that part of the meeting. Typically, the committee administration will not respond to comments during public participation. Please use the hand raise feature. Um, Adam will be keeping everybody to three minutes. So um, if you'd wish to speak, then uh, Superintendent Light will allow you to. And just to um, go over our procedure here, uh, so we have made a couple of security updates since the last meeting. Um, one, we've disabled the question and answer function um, on Zoom so that that's no longer available to anyone. But in addition, at the beginning of public participation, um, the first thing that we're asking everyone to do is state their first and last name, um, as well as their street and town that they that they live in. Um, and then we'll then you can begin speaking. So again, you know, please when you are called on, first and last name, street, and town that you live in. So thank you. All right, Corinne. Hi, thanks. Actually, I did have my name's Corinne Hogsteth. I live on Seminole Road in Acton, and I actually did. Oh, did Rick leave? My question was for Rick. That's all right. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Right, um, Alyssa. This is Alyssa Nickel from School Street in Acton. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I want to express my appreciation for this committee's decision to retire the colonial mascot. It was obviously a difficult and well-considered decision. I gather that you're hearing often from individuals who are unhappy with the decision the process at which you arrived at the decision, and those folks are asking you to rescind your vote. So I'd like to speak directly to them. I know there are some who disagree, but this is not a case of political correctness run amok. Instead, it is a case of compassion, an effort initiated by students to be inclusive, an acknowledgement that the time has arrived to act. Neither is it a case of the school committee caving to political pressure or being moved by a changing wind. What an insult to the students and staff who have made it known for years, if not decades, that this symbol did not represent them. Benjamin Franklin said, justice will not be served until those who are unaffected are as outraged as those who are. The events this summer have resulted in not only pressure to be anti-racist, but permission as well. A tipping point has been reached in terms of the increased number of white allies who will no longer remain silent and aloof, and in the number of schools deciding to retire problematic mascots. Several of you have raised the issue of conflict of interest. State law does not prohibit members to advocate on behalf of their own children so long as no special consideration is 
requested. Imagine if a recusal were needed whenever a member's child would be impacted by a school committee decision. A quorum would never be achieved. Also, students have a legally protected right to privacy, and yet several of you have demanded that a list of absage members be published. Many of you say you only want more time and more careful consideration to be given to such an impactful decision. This discussion and vote took place after a petition and supporting correspondence was submitted in July. A One minute. Was given in September, and extensive feedback was actively sought by reaching out to every junior high and high school student, the faculty, alumni, parents, and community members via email, social media, and the press. The district's values of wellness, equity, and engagement line the bottom of many of tonight's meeting packet documents. I thank this committee for showing leadership, for valuing the wellness of school community members, and for acting in the best interest of the school community. I strongly urge you to remain strong in your commitment to stand by that decision. Thank you, Alyssa. Uh, Andrew, can you identify yourself, your street and your town, please? I can. My name is Andrew Ruggiero, and I spent my childhood on Great Road in Acton. So I appreciate uh, the committee again opening up the conversation to the public. Uh, and I wanted to start off with a quote from Maya Angelou. If you don't know where you're, you've come from, you don't know where you're going. And I think that in the light of uh, the topic of the mascot, it's important to recognize the history of our town and our country. Now I want to read a quick excerpt from the PBS History of the American Flag. Today the flag consists of 13 horizontal stripes, 7 red alternating with 6 white. The stripes represent the original 13 colonies and the stars represent the 50 states of the union. The colors of the flag are symbolic as well. Red symbolizes hardiness and valor. White symbolizes purity and innocence and blue represents vigilance, perseverance and justice. Applying that to the history of our town being in one of the original 13 colonies, I think it's really disappointing that a creative license has been taken on what the definition of an Acton Boxborough colonial is and then cherry picking the very worst possible definition of that term and its uses throughout global history to make a case against it. It denies history, it denies the history of our country, it leads to a sense of complacency in the face of authoritarianism, and I think it's more important that the children of Acton and residents focus on our town's history, learn from the lessons so we know where we're going, and we don't repeat the worst parts of our history. So the colonial mascot, again, it is not for creative license, its roots are in our national flag, and you can see that clearly by the illustration of the 13 stripes and what they mean. I cede the rest of my time to the floor. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you, Andrew. Lauren, you can speak. Can you identify yourself and, you know, street and town? Hi, I'm Lauren Rosenzweig Morton. Um, I was a two term select person in Acton um, back in kind of a while ago, 2006 to 2012, I think it was. Um, before that, the planning board and the economic development committee. And um, I came late to this whole mascot discussion. And, you know, I wasn't sure if it's the mascot or the name. and. You know, mostly I've been in COVID land trying to keep my 97-year-old mother alive. So um, I have been, I did go back and I watched some of the meetings. And first, let me say, school committee, that you've been really doing an amazing job in a very difficult time with COVID, with racial strife in the country, with lots of things going on. So, and I appreciate to see, you know, I worked very early on on improving the diversity of our town boards and committees, and I'm thrilled to see more diversity. Um, one thing I learned when I was a select woman was that even though Acton has 21,000 and Boxborough, I forget how many lately, but um, we're a small town. Um, the people that we're dealing with on these issues are our neighbors and friends and, you know, maybe people we don't know so well. 
and maybe people that don't know you so well. And the one thing I want to say is whether you bring back, you know, the discussion on the colonials or, or not, I think there's a group of people in town that this meant a lot to. There's a lot of feelings around the teams, the spirit, all those things. And I really do think that one-on-one -on -one conversations need to take place. People need to explain, as, as Alyssa just did and as uh, other people have, you know, what it means to people of color or indigenous people that, you know, what they went through with um, being, you know, with the name Colonial. What effect does it really have on you? And one minute remaining. Okay. Um, on my deck, I, I bought one of those heaters. <laughs> so if people are very worried about COVID and want to come meet one-to-one -one with a person that cares a lot about the whole Colonial issue and wants to talk about what it means to them and learn a little bit more about why people have found it to be such a hurtful thing for them. Um, I think that would go a long way to healing our town. Um, we really can't just diss or dismiss a whole other group's opinions. You know, it, it may seem trivial to you, but I assure you it's very, very meaningful and important to them. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, uh, Andrew, can you identify yourself, street and town? Hey there, this is Andrew Tavalachi, and I live on Old uh, Harvard Road in Boxborough. Um, uh, on the topic of talking about other groups um, and other people, um, I want to make a comment about, about Rick's presentation. Um, I thought it was very insightful. Um, and very interesting. And I think um, that it was, I, I kept thinking he was talking about me. I thought he was talking about the, the working week. Uh, the things that he said about being home as a high school student, I was um, very, very much uh, representing uh, for, uh, for a working adult. Uh, felt the same, uh, I felt the same way that he did as far as high school students felt. I think if you if you consider what he said to be true and representative of all high school students, I would say that that is multiplied tenfold for middle school students and then tenfold again for elementary school students. So if if the things he says are are valid for the high school level, I think it's even worse for the for the younger kids. Um, and I think that should be, you know, considered uh, when we're talking about our district and the, uh, the ability of uh, remote learning to take place. Um, it, should be, it should be everybody who's considered, not just the, not just the high school students. That's really all I, I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And that actually is everyone. Uh, the, only, the two people with their hand up actually already spoke. So I think we are all set in terms of public speak. So I just wanted to um, read a statement. We, we um, rarely respond to, to public speak. Um, the last couple of weeks, we've had a lot of public speak, and I know that there has been some interest in, in uh, amongst committee members about clarifying some of the things that, that have been shared during public speak, not tonight necessarily, although Alyssa spoke to some of them. Um, the reason for this, for the reason that we don't usually respond is that there are often items outside of the agenda. But I wanted to clarify a few things, however, because over the course of the last few weeks, a few members of the community have persisted in presenting information that is incorrect. Um, that did not happen tonight. That wasn't what people have spoken to, but, but several people did allude to it. I understand that there are many members of the community who disagree with our unanimous vote to retire the colonial mascot. They persisted in presenting their concerns at all of our meetings since the decision was made. So let me clarify. 
Prior to our decision to retire the mascot, all members of the committee were aware that two petitions had been created. While we were aware of both petitions, let me be clear, only one petition was officially presented to the committee with all of its signatures, and that was created by the students of Absedge in their efforts to retire the mascot. In our efforts to understand the perspective of all stakeholders, a request went out on September 25th for public comment. And let me quote that. The committee recognizes that the Acton Boxborough community includes many members and groups who may have a variety of views on the issue before the committee. The school committee will deliberate on the petition again and consider action at its meeting October 15th, 2020. We invite the public to submit comments in writing by Wednesday, October 14th by emailing us. While we recognize the public comment is not a vote, we are interested in hearing a variety of opinions on changing the mascot to help make our deliberation more meaningful. That is a, um, that went out to all members of, of our community and was distributed in, in multiple ways. The creators of the petition to keep the mascot did write to the committee and they did meet with the superintendent about their concerns. When the students wrote to us originally, they made clear their desire to remain anonymous. The original request they made was to meet with the committee between meetings. Because we are a public body, we cannot as a committee meet with individuals outside of our open meetings. So the superintendent met with them. One of these students later emailed us again as part of our request for public comment. The student made us aware of the second petition and that it had 2,300 signatures, but the petition itself was not sent to us. Regardless, when we met to deliberate, we met with the knowledge of its existence and that there was a large group in the community who wished to preserve the colonial mascot. We have heard comments that all sides were not represented, but this is not accurate. As our request stated explicitly, public comment was not going to be considered a vote. Our mailboxes were flooded with comment. Nearly 700 emails were received and read. While there were many impassioned letters about the merits of keeping the colonial, most of the responses we received from people interested in maintaining the mascot were simply names with a subject line of keep the colonial. Let me repeat, this was not a public vote and it was never intended to be. As many members noted in, the st in their statements on 1015, we all spent many hours reading the comments of our community members. Not only did we receive letters from current students and staff, we received letters from alumni, community members, and elected officials. This unanimous decision was not made in a silo, and it was made with the support of the high school principal and the superintendent, as well as other members of the leadership team. One of the most passionate community members wrote a letter that was shared by many who wished to keep the mascot. That member of the Acton Boxborough Regional High School class of 89 was impassioned in his defense of the values he felt were at the core of the colonial mascot. After our unanimous decision, this same alumni wrote again to the committee, and I quote, ladies and gentlemen, I just like to say well done. Thank you for the well considered discussion of the retirement of the colonial. You are each a credit to the town. I logged into the meeting very much in favor of keeping the colonial. I left convinced that its retirement was the right thing for the school. I am prayerful that the community can quickly decide on a new mascot that all students can claim as their own. I understand that we are not all going to agree, but to claim that we didn't listen or consider all perspectives is false. This decision has been made by unanimous consent. We as a committee have many other responsibilities to the students of our district and we will not be reconsidering our vote. And I hope that that is the last that we have to say about the colonial, but um, thank you for listening. <laughs> and um, if everyone is okay, we will move on to the next um, agenda item, which is uh, the superintendent's update. So Peter, if you're all set, then go right ahead. Sure. So, you know, thank you, Tessa. Um, you know, a, a few different updates, um, you know, one, COVID uh, case numbers, uh, there's a new dashboard at the state level that they just released. It's an interactive dashboard. Um, I have not gotten a chance to go on this afternoon between five o'clock and now to look at the, the weekly numbers. Um, but I do know, you know, from our discussions with the Board of Health, you know, we are right around that 2223 uh, case mark in Acton, which is slightly down. Uh, from what it had been earlier in December. Um, and we're just at about a 4% uh, positivity rate. Um, five would be the benchmark uh, that would send Acton into be cons being considered a red community. So we certainly need to watch that. 
Boxborough um, has been hovering uh, consistently for a couple of weeks, right around the 20 to 21 uh, cases. Um, and because Boxborough is a smaller community, it's a different metric uh, than Acton uses. Um, so Boxborough, it's a hard case count that would be used to uh, determine whether or not it was a yellow, red, or green community. Um, the threshold for Boxborough being a red community would be 25 cases. Um, so right now, Boxborough is kind of at that upper end of yellow. So we're watching that carefully as well. One thing on the COVID front we did uh, want to do, we have had um, some gatherings among families and groups of students that continue to be a source of concern for us. Uh, we really deeply understand the need for our students to be connected. Um, and, uh, you know, but attendance at the gatherings uh, for students in our hybrid program in particular poses a really risky situation for our students, educators, and families um, at home. We're sending a communication to all, all of our families specific to gatherings, but it's important to note that we expect our students to adhere to the governor's executive order uh, with respect to gatherings, masks, and social distancing. And just anecdotally, uh, what we are seeing is students might get together with a couple of other students um, on the small side, or sometimes it's, you know, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 students. Um, they're getting together because they tend to be a close friend group. So I think um, families feel like they're doing a lot of things correctly, and we appreciate that. Um, and I think what we're seeing is that students may start off wearing masks and kind of keeping that six feet of distance. But over the course of, you know, an evening or whenever they're gathering, um, those masks inevitably come off at some point or um, the social distancing is is reduced and students are really kind of close together, which I, I truly understand that because they're kids um, and those are, you know, we all want to be together. Um, but that is challenging for us as a school district. So we are sending something out to families. Um, we took a hard look with our local health departments today and as well as our school physicians to think about what an appropriate um, kind of duration would be to make sure that kids are safe and they don't have um, access to the virus. So we did revise some of our guidelines. We had been having everyone quarantined for the 14 day period, similar as a close contact, but we were able to talk about it a little more with our school physicians. And we've reduced that really to where the state is, where it's, um, you know, someone can get a negative test that's given on day, I believe, Don, it's six, five. It's day five or later. Day five or later. And then they're eligible to return on day eight afterward. Um, if they don't want to get tested, uh, then they can um, fulfill the 14-day quarantine period. So we just want to make sure families know what's going on with that. So as people make decisions about what they're doing at home, um, they're aware of the, the, the situation at school. Uh, this is not a position that we want to be in as a school district, but it's something certainly that we have to make sure we're consistent about in order to um, make sure everyone at school is safe. We have a wide variety of beliefs in our community about um, transmission of the virus. Uh, you know, we have been fortunate that we have not seen any transmission from students to faculty or students to students inside our schools that we know of. Um, and that's a real positive. But I think it's something that we are going to continue to err on the side of caution, particularly as we're in this next surge uh, post holidays. So just a little bit of information there. I wanted to give the committee an uh, update into the investigation into the incident from the last school committee meeting. Um, as all of the communities are aware, we had an incident at the last meeting on December 17th where two of you were targeted. Um, you know, through the question and answer um, feature of the chat um, in Zoom, the Acton Police are continuing to investigate, and I just had an opportunity to talk to the Chief of Police in today um, regarding an update, and they are working very closely now with the Middlesex Middlesex District Attorney's Office and other agencies to determine who may have been behind the incident. Uh, we don't know that yet and are still working on it. At the district level, we have reviewed our security features for public meetings and have disabled the Q&A function within Zoom for public meetings. Anyone wishing to speak publicly will now be asked to state their name and street in either Acton or Boxborough before addressing the committee. Because the primary function of our Zoom of Zoom for our district is classroom purposes, some of the security protocols that we talk to the town about and they have in place just simply don't work um, for us. So, for example, uh, the town uses the chat feature to temporarily chat um, with um, participants. 
um, if they don't recognize who that is. We explored doing that, but it's unfortunately a universal setting. So if we modified the chat function for school committee meetings, it would actually modify it for all classes as well. Um, and one of the reasons we disable it um, is we found as schools were doing um, all school meetings, um, the kids found the chat function and they were chatting inappropriately with each other. Um, and so we're a, a little bit stymied because some of the things we're doing for student safety um, and to make, make sure that safe for kids work against us to be able to utilize more in the public meeting. So we are kind of towing that line between, um, you know, being a school and also a public entity at the same time. So just, you know, please be aware we are doing everything we can to make sure our meetings are safe. Um, also, as a follow-up to the incident, we have been working um, really closely now with the leadership in both of our towns. Uh, John Mangioretti, Ryan Farrar, and I have been having you know several conversations about this, um, about how we can collaboratively broaden the conversation um, with kind of a focus on respectful dialogue, equity, and inclusion to our broader community so that universally we can all do a better job uh, together in combating hate in all of its forms. We're hopeful that by aligning some of the efforts across the towns and schools, we can actually help our community move forward from this um, and some of the other hateful incidents that we've had over the last few years. Essentially, what we're realizing is that if we all continue to work in our silos, where the schools are working on one set of initiatives, Acton might be working in another set, and Boxborough is working in another set, we're really not going to have the impact that we want to have. Um, and another thing that we've been really thinking about, um, and this goes to Lauren's comments um, earlier in the meeting, is we want to look at ways that even if we disagree on issues, we can think of ourselves as neighbors um, and understand that we might end up disagreeing on an issue, but we can still have a you know dialogue about that. And you know we may end up disagreeing, and it's not always about changing everyone's mind, uh, because so there are some issues that we're never going to agree completely on. Uh, but we want to have that respectful dialogue. So that's some element of it. But um, we're also doing that knowing that we're really committed to equity and there's going to be times that we have to make some decisions that disappoint people. Um, and it's not that we're going to shy away from those decisions necessarily. It's simply that we have to understand that as we make decisions, we're not going to ever be able to please everyone. And we still need to treat each other as neighbors. We need to treat each other as fellow community members. Um, and when we see each other in grocery stores, we need to be able to have that conversation with each other. So um, just a little bit of a thought on that. And that's something that we are working on uh, between the two town managers and I. Um, and we're hoping to have a little bit more information in the coming weeks um, because we're, we're, we're still in process. Um, MCAS testing, I just want to give a little bit of information on that. Desi just recently released a memo, and I think um, it went out on the MASC listserv as well, uh, but they are announcing some modifications to the MCAS assessment for the 2020-21 school year pending a vote of the board. Some of the highlights include uh, a modified competency determination for our current seniors. So these are students who may not have received a passing score on MCAS yet. Um, they are offering an alternative that if they take one of our approved classes within our high school, they can achieve their competency determination that way so that they're not being penalized for kind of pandemic learning. Um, also, MCAS tests for students in grades three through eight will be administered in the spring, but students will participate in a much shortened version of the test, recognizing that time of learning has been impacted. Um, there will also be consideration of waiving some accountability for some underperforming districts. Uh, the access testing window also this year is being extended from what usually ends in mid-February right through the end, uh, May 20th, which is almost the end of our school year. And then DESE is also providing some flexibility to schools around the administration of biology MCAS for ninth grade students. Um, I'm going to put a big caveat on that is they haven't sent any additional information out. So I would love to be able to answer any questions that you have about that. But um, I I'm almost literally reading off of their uh, memo that they sent us. So no other information. And I just went to a webinar today where a lot of superintendents were asking. And DESE said it's forthcoming. So we're, we're eagerly anticipating more. Uh, building project update. Um, I'm doing this in the general update portion of the meeting. Um, and, you know, we can certainly come back to it, but I wanted to also put it here because this is information that goes out 
to our families. Uh, but construction of the new elementary school is underway, which is very, very exciting. Our contractor, which is Consigli, has been excavating geothermal wells and pouring concrete for footings and foundation walls. That's the major work that's been going on. Um, there have been several unanticipated challenges that we found early in the project, mostly related to underground conditions. Uh, these challenges have resulted in some early change orders to the project. Um, in order to excavate additional soil and to remove some existing ledge uh, where the new bus loop of the building is going to be located. While the cost of the changes was very frustrating for building committee members um, and everyone involved in the project early on, the building committee was able to use the contingency money built into the budget to cover those costs. Um, on December 19th, we received our guaranteed maximum price from Consigli. And that GMP, which is the guaranteed maximum price for the construction project, is now set um, at a hard cap of 88737000 and change. That is actually $6.5 million under the amount that was set in the project budget. Uh, the building committee determined to replenish all of the contingencies um, that had been used for some of that early work. Um, and after all the contingencies have been replenished, the project is now running approximately $2.5 million under the original project budget. So the budget for that is some good news. Um, I also just want to make a note because we recognize tax bills were recently sent to residents and there was a noticeable increase in taxes due to the building project. Um, you know, based on the recommendation of our debt strategy subcommittee, um, the district actually has borrowed nearly all of the money required for the project early in this process. And because of the timing of the bonds we issued in early March, we were actually able to take advantage of just about the lowest historic interest rate um, in history for municipal bonds. Um, we are very, very grateful to our community for supporting the project. We also recognize uh, the challenges of the increased taxes during this really difficult um, I don't think as we were passing the building project, anyone saw um, a pandemic coming within two months. Um, we recognize that and, you know, we feel for all the residents in terms of tax rate. Um, but, you know, one of the benefits of, of bonding that project up front uh, was to be able to take advantage of those low interest rates. So uh, we are locked in for 30 years at a very, very low interest rate. Uh, we also publish construction uh, updates weekly on our building project website and we'll be sending a link also to families who wish to receive emails uh, directly with those weekly updates. Next update, um, community coffees um, is something that Tessa and I started doing last year um, and we are going to be resuming those in early February. Um, we are sending a schedule through the end of the year and we will send Zoom links to families as dates approach for that. We will also provide families with an opportunity to, to submit some questions in advance of meetings so that we can make the most efficient use of time. Uh, one unfortunate result of the pandemic though is that people will need to provide their own coffee and snacks for the meeting. We cannot do that. Um, so just, you know, we are looking forward to families joining us and being able to resume that. And then finally, um, FY22 budget update, you know, just for families mostly, but again, due to the impact of COVID-19 and the uncertainty surrounding school programming for next year, the district worked with our school committee and elected boards in both towns to delay the budget process for the school's FY22 budget. We are currently preparing our preliminary budget presentation for our next school committee meeting, which is January 21st. We recognize that this may be a challenging budget year and again, plan for some uncertainty around FY22. We will keep everyone posted um, throughout the process. And that is it for me for updates. John, you have a question? I, I wanted to comment on a, a couple of things. It, one is, you know, it was fantastic to hear the good news about the budget um, and the new school building. And, it, you know, one of the unfortunate things of all of the things the school committee has had to deal with this year is that we haven't been able to celebrate and enjoy, you know, the excitement of working towards that new facility, which will really, really change um, education, you know, in a couple of years. And I, I just didn't want that to get lost, you know, with everything else, because um, it is something to be very excited about and, and, to, and to be very, you know, proud of. Um, and then I just also wanted to uh, commend Peter for, you know, recognizing um, the, the tax impact, you know, that just came through, which, you know, clearly, you know, was very noticeable when people got their bills. And I think, again, as Peter very correctly stated, um, this was, you know, a great decision, but we wish the timing had been a little bit different. That the long-term impact of that low interest rate is fantastic as we look at the next 30 years of the district, but 
you know, this short-term impact this year, this is tough. And I, obviously that will factor in our, our budget discussions for FY22. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to comment on was uh, the COVID situation. Um, and, and there were a couple things that um, I wanted to mention. One is that, you know, we continue to be just in a sort of a terrible environment right now in January. Um, and, you know, I expect that sort of will continue to February. So it, it is extremely important um, to send out that message to students and families that, you know, if you were ever going to work hard on your precautions, now is the time to do it. But then, you know, I want to tie together, you know, a few different themes have been going on. And the question is, you know, how should we work together to change behavior? Should we work together to change behavior in a punitive kind of way, or should we try and work together to change behavior in a constructive and supportive way? And I'm sure that you all know where that's going because it was very important to me that in our statement um, about the racist incident, incident that occurred, um, that it include the statement that our objective is to become inclusive and loving. Um, so regardless of what we're doing, whether we're working you know, on building a community you know, around our team identities or whether we're working on our community in terms of uh, trying to respond appropriately to a very challenging infectious disease circumstance, that work needs to be done by, with, by, with love, you know, by you know, our, our staff, by our school committee, and, and by everybody in town. And if that work is done with love as we try to um, you know, deal with these challenges, we'll be better off. And of course, if it's dealt with in a punitive way, it's going to be very hard. So I just encourage everyone to, you know, approach this work with love. Thanks, John. Um, it looks like we have, uh, that Corinne is raising her hand in the audience, Peter. Okay. Corinne? Hi, this is Corinne Hogsworth. I still live on Seminole Road in Acton. Um, I had two questions and a comment. My first question is for Peter. And I asked this in an email, and I, um, it's regarding the quarantines. Uh, is the requirement to quarantine suspected close contacts a state requirement or a district regulation? So the quarantine for close contacts, the only group that can quarantine anyone for a close contact is a local board of health. Uh, so we actually don't quarantine people. Um, we actually just discussed that today. So that, that is a state, any quarantine period is a state requirement. However, um, with our physicians and health department, we talked about quarantines today, um, and the, the health people were very strong in feeling that the quarantine period is um, exactly what I read earlier from um, kind of our gatherings plan, which is, you know, you can either have the test on day five, and then you could return on day eight and then monitor yourself. Um, that's the quarantine. However, um, the, the health people really felt right now that we should continue to follow the period that we've been excluding students from school um, who are close contacts. And the reason being is that we have specifically had multiple students um, who are converting very late in the period, um, and specifically around, I believe, between day 10 and 14. And I think a number of them were actually even on like day 13 and 14. So, um, the, the medical professionals that we consult with continue to feel like they want us to, to take a cautious move with that. But um, I, I do remember your email. I promised you that I would talk about that with our health experts, and we did today. But um, it, it's still a recommendation that we stick with what we're doing. Sure, thank you. I only brought it up because, again, as I mentioned in my email, oh, the state of Ohio has done away with this requirement because the transmission in schools is so low, and it's just causing kids to needlessly miss school. Um, so my other question, I guess this goes to um, – John's uh, comments about the taxes, maybe both of yours, is, is any, when will there be some consideration given to looking at the formula, the assessment formula again? It hasn't been looked at since regionalization, and it was it was broken at the beginning. Um, you know, has anybody talked about that? I don't know who would do that. If it would be the FinComs or the Board of Selectmen or, or you guys, I don't know. But that's, I would just, that's something I think that has to be looked at again. So, and then my other question or comment, this is my comment, it was with regard to the um, the environment. I can't remember exactly what you were saying, but um, the, the school environment is absolutely toxic. And when you talk about 
you know, like people being able to agree to disagree and be civil and all this stuff. There are teachers who are telling kids, um, you know, belittling them for their political state beliefs. I'll just, that's just like a really bland, understated way to say it. Um, I ran into one of my neighbors tonight when I was taking a walk and she's in the high school and she said, they just, they, she had a couple teachers that just spent the whole time bashing people that supported Trump. And she's like, and you can't say anything. And that's part of the problem is that kids who are not in the minority or not in the majority rather, or can I say, how do I say that? Yeah. If you're not in the majority, they feel like they can't speak up. I, I had another friend I was talking to yesterday. There's a, the, the kids have a word for it now. It's called a Frexit. <laughs> when they stop, they have to completely separate from their groups of friends One they minute remaining. because they can't tolerate each other's opinions. And I bring, and I know this comes from the families and I know it starts way before they get to high school, but the faculty don't help. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Corinne. All right, Peter. Did you, I don't think we have anyone else on the committee that, that has a response. Um, and the next, the, ne the next item on the agenda is also you. So, I know, I know. <laughs> I'll allow you to just keep on going. All right. Um, so the next item on the agenda um, is to, I want to share some of the results of the student learning time survey um, and talk about, you know, our recommended resolution um, in terms of what we're going to do. Um, you know, there were some really interesting results that came back. So I'm going to actually go ahead and share my screen and just provide a little bit of an anchor for people who might be listening and have not seen the packet. Uh, but all of this is published in the packet and people can access the information. Uh, so there we go. Are you all looking at something that looks, I, I just lost my version, vision of the screen, so I apologize. Yeah. Are you looking at pandemic learning time survey highlights? We are. Okay. So, you know, I just want to give a couple general notes on this. Um, you know, uh, one, you know, I'm going over, I'm not going to go over all of our data uh, tonight. The focus of the analysis that we're doing right now is on respondent satisfaction with our hybrid program. Um, and the reason being is that we were very, very time constrained right now. And we are required to respond to DESE by regulation um, within a time period. And we didn't have time to try and go through all of our data, but we did have to pull the data that was specific to looking at our hybrid program, which was what DESE uh, needs us to respond to. So if you are here and you're in the remote program, um, please do not be offended that I'm not talking about that tonight, but everything I'm gonna talk about is around the hybrid program. Overall, with the survey, though, we had about 2,900 families in our district uh, respond across all levels. We had about two students, um, 2,000 students, uh, respond in grades 3 through 12. Uh, we did end up using the result, uh, analysis results for grades 4 through 12. Uh, when we talked to some of our educators who were seeing the students respond in grades 3, there was enough confusion around some of the questions that we didn't feel the data was going to be reliable. Um, and then we had about 500 of our educators respond across all levels. There were some survey limitations and disclaimers that I want to give. Um, one, uh, there was very rapid design and turnaround due to the DES DESI regulation timing. Uh, we were also um, very, very busy um, at the end of the week prior to break uh, with a number of things going on around the district. And we wish we had been able to give this a little bit more time, but we were just trying to get something out so we could get some feedback. Um, there were some inconsistencies when we collected the data. For example, um, we had a couple of things that um, were either on a 10 point scale or a 100 point scale. Um, we ended up normalizing our results based on a 100 point scale just for consistency of reporting. Um, there were some incomplete responses, skipped questions that could skew some of the data. Um, and some of our survey vocabulary around synchronous or asynchronous learning could have been confusing for some of our students and families. Um, but we were trying to really match it with what the regulations were talking to. So we were consistent with what we were talking about. We do have a document. Um, and if people go to the packet and we will send something to families tomorrow with the same links um, where people can actually look at a little bit of an analysis of that that's more detailed. But I do want to share a couple of highlights with you, and I, I will probably pull up the more detailed analysis after this. 
Um, but overall satisfaction with the hybrid program, about 60% of families reported being either satisfied or very satisfied with the program across levels, and about 20% of our families reported some level of dissatisfaction across the levels. Um, in true Acton or Boxborough fashion, we offered people two categories of satisfaction and three levels of dissatisfaction um, that they could choose from. And then there was a neutral in the middle. About 20% of our families chose uh, that reported that they were neither dissatisfied or satisfied. Um, High school families report a slightly higher level of dissatisfaction, about 25%. Um, I do have a wonder if that's due to maybe um, differences in access to education for some of our students who had to go through a period of quarantine. Um, it's a wonder I have. In hindsight, I wish I had asked the question of were you quarantined, um, because that would have given us some insight into that data. Students. About 45% of our students reported being satisfied or very satisfied with the program across levels. Um, there was a higher level of satisfaction in grades four through eight. There was slightly lower satisfaction at the high school. Um, grades four through eight reported around 50 to 55% satisfaction, lower at the high school around 30%. Um, I ended up being curious about why that might be, and I looked into some of the reports um, and different questions that we had asked. And the one that I was able to correlate that most to was uh, um, I started filtering some of the high school responses based on the amount of asynchronous work they were receiving. And what was striking is as soon as students uh, started reporting more than about four hours of asynchronous work, the level of dissatisfaction declined sharply. Uh, excuse me, increased sharply, um, and the level of satisfaction declined sharply. So it does appear that there's a breaking point for kids uh, when they are working independently, where they just can't have more. So um, that is certainly something that we've already talked to the high school about and they're looking at. 25% um, of our students reported some level of dissatisfaction. And again, it was slightly higher um, at the high school than in the lower grades, and about 30% reported feeling kind of neutral. From an educator perspective, 80% uh, reported being satisfied or very satisfied with the program across levels. 8% reported some level of dissatisfaction and about 12% um, kind of were in that, that neutral range. The next piece of analysis I'm going to share actually combines two of our questions. We reported, uh, we asked families a question about um, to what degree did they feel their child was receiving enough remote synchronous instruction? Um, but then we also asked another question asking if they thought adding remote synchronous time would make things better for their kids. Um, because we want, and I wanted to actually correlate those two at the same time. Um, so, but what was interesting is for families, about 40 to 50% of families felt there was too little remote synchronous time or live time. Um, but there was disagreement among our families that adding any additional synchronous learning time on the remote days would be beneficial for their kids. Um, so there was disagreement whether or not adding just simply Zoom time with teachers was really going to help uh, solve the problem. About 30% of families thought that would have value, but about 50 to 60% actually reported that they did not believe that would be beneficial. Um, and about 10 to 15% were neutral um, in their feelings around that. In all honesty, uh, you know, my hypothesis being a parent myself, um, is a recognition that kids really just need to be back in school um, and they need to be back with us full time. Um, so I, I, that actually would solve the live time problem and, you know, kind of satisfy the sense of maybe it's really not about Zoom solving the world's problems. Um, I think for families in the remote program who chose a remote environment, there was really an understanding that that was a large piece of it. But for families who wanted to be in person, it was really about the value of in-person learning. From a student perspective, a strong majority of our students felt that um, the amount of remote synchronous time is appropriate. 70% uh, at grades four through eight, it was lower at the high school, um, but at the high school, um, it was about 52% of students feeling the amount was appropriate, but 40% of high school students felt there was too much. Um, remote synchronous time. Um, I'm wondering if that could be due to the fact that the high school students were the only ones who have experienced kind of that fully remote schedule, um, who had signed up for hybrid learning. There were mixed responses by students as to whether or not they thought 
there was any benefit to additional synchronous time. High school students generally did not see it as beneficial. Junior high and elementary students were either neutral or saw little benefit to additional synchronous time on remote days. Educators, a strong majority of educators believed that our current amount of synchronous time was appropriate. Most educators did not report any perceived benefit to adding additional synchronous instructional time. There was a small group of educators um, at the high school who did see some benefit in that, but it was still a very strong majority that did not think additional synchronous time was going to be of that much benefit. Asynchronous learning time, this is not part of the SLT requirements, but it was a significant enough piece that I do want to share it with you. Um, a really strong majority of families reported that they didn't feel like there was enough asynchronous work. Again, they didn't feel like there was enough asynchronous work for their, their children. Um, there was a small percentage of families, about 15, who thought that it was actually too much, um, although that was more of concern at the high school level. From a student standpoint, 70 to 75% of students um, in grades four through eight reported they thought it was just about right. That is, does not surprise me. Um, if we're asking students, do you want more work? Um, so, you know, that's something to think about. Um, and less than five thought there was too little work for them. Um, at the high school, students were evenly divided that there was either too much work or just the right, right amount of work. Um, and again, I, I just bring us back to that level of dissatisfaction that I mentioned earlier among high school kids, that there is a breaking point for what kids can handle um, during a pandemic. Educators, the vast majority of educators reported feeling that um, students were are give, being given the right amount of asynchronous work. That was between 90 and 95 percent. Um, 73 percent of high school educators um, reported that as well, uh, but there were, were about 20% of high school educators that felt there was too much, and about 7% felt there was too little. Um, a bonus question that we asked was around snow days. Um, again, there was not a high level of agreement among all groups. Uh, families and educators did indicate a preference for remote learning days over traditional snow days by a margin of three to two, and, but our students had a preference for snow days, kind of at a two to one rate. Um, I believe any seniors that took the survey were unanimous in wanting snow days um, with the full knowledge that they are the only group that does not have to make up any days at the end of the year. Um, so we're also aware of that. Um, in all honesty, um, in terms of snow days, I foresee us continuing a general pattern where we are doing remote learning days. However, I really recognize how students feel about this and, you know, a, a good portion of our families and educators. I, you know, am aware of that. And if, you know, we have an opportunity where we're looking at a storm that we think could end up knocking power out, we'll certainly, you know, consider, you know, having a traditional snow day in that. So it will probably end up over the course of the year being some combination of remote learning. But if we can, you know, squeeze a traditional snow day in, I, I recognize that. So, you know, I'm just, before I get into kind of the, the summary information, I just want to show you, this is the way um, we chose to pull the data out. Um, we asked a lot of people, um, you know, kind of to rate a level of satisfaction with a scale where a, a rating of five meant that they believed whatever we were asking was just, a, a, just about the right amount. Um, and a lower rating of, of zero would have been, way too little or a rating of 100 was way too much of something. And so rather than just presenting averages, I, I really felt like an average could get skewed in that type of a question. And so what I ended up doing was banding results. Um, for better and worse, I, I, I made that decision myself about how banding should look. And I chose a band in the middle of about a rating of 40 to 60, being a group that considered it about right. Um, and that meant some people felt like it was eh, a little on the shy side of it. And some people might've felt like it was a little bit too much, but overall it was kind of that we're, a, we're about right. And under 40 for a rating was, we felt very strongly that there was too little of something or over 60 was, we felt very strongly there was too much. I'm not gonna go through all of this right now. I know you have it in the packet, um, but I just did wanna highlight uh, some of the reasoning for that decision-making. And what I chose to do just to make it a little bit easier to digest was to highlight some of the significant data that, that we looked at. Um, so we were transparent about how we were looking at information. I'm gonna go back over to this. Um, so 
overall summary of the data as we saw it as a leadership team is that there is a generally high level of satisfaction with our current program among stakeholders um, with families in particular reporting being satisfied or highly satisfied at a rate three times higher than those that reported any level of dissatisfaction. Um, universally, all three respondent groups, families, educators, and students indicated that they wish students were engaged uh, for more synchronous learning time. However, the data indicates that the respondents didn't all really agree that more time on Zoom was going to be the best solution for that. Um, and then all of our data, um, excuse me, our data also indicates families believe that a daily check-in for uh, junior high and high school students on their asynchronous days would benefit them. That is something that we did ask. Um, and there was a very, very strong feeling among our families that a check-in on students asynchronous days would be beneficial. Um, I will note, um, just to make sure our students have a voice here, the students did not necessarily feel the same way. Um, I think some of the students kind of enjoy the freedom of those asynchronous days, um, but families felt very strongly and that's something we want to listen to. Um, recommended actions, you know, we believe that based on the feedback we received, we should implement um, the required daily check-in on asynchronous days for our students in grades seven through 12. Our elementary students already have that um, and have had that since the beginning of the pandemic um, where they are checking in with assistance um, and they should be having an hour a day with the assistance. Um, so we are gonna be moving ahead to implement that. Also based on our family educator and student survey data, uh, we um, believe and that we should request a waiver from DESE with regard to the um, 35 hours of live time over a two week period. We just don't see um, that adding more Zoom time is really going to satisfy the needs of what the community seemed to be looking for. Um, I would much rather be planning for a full return from our, for our students than planning for um, you know additional live synchronous time. And I think with the vaccine on the horizon, you know, I think, you know, we, we, that could end up being a bit more of a reality um, this year. We just don't know exactly what the timeline is going to be because we don't really know the timeline for our educators to be vaccinated. Um, and they do have to get both rounds of the vaccine. They has, you know, take several weeks for it to take effect. So um, there is some thinking around that, but we, we are thinking about how we could try and return more kids uh, into our classrooms. Um, you know, if, for some reason, um, you know, we don't get the waiver because it is not guaranteed that just because we think we want a waiver um, that that's going to be granted by DESE. Uh, but, you know, our goal would be, you know, to integrate some of our students at home um, on their, you know, remote days into um, periods of the day, such as like morning meetings, read alouds, uh, daily, possibly a daily closing activity. Um, I'm, I am concerned about that from an equity standpoint because a lot of our students are in various childcare programs um, that have schedules set around what we originally told people. Um, I also know that, you know, particularly for younger students, whether or not they can get online is highly dependent on how available a parent is to help them with that. So um, that, that does concern me a bit at the elementary level. Um, at the secondary level, um, you know, I think what we would look potentially to do is increase the duration of Wednesdays, uh, the Wednesday schedule by about an hour or so. Um, and, you know, and then really think about adding time possibly to the beginning or end of the school day uh, could be another possible solution, um, so, which I think stays consistent a bit with our overall goal of maximizing the in-person time. Um, but that, that would be another way to solve that. What I will say is these are only given right now for examples um, to be able to frame some of the solutions that we might uh, put in place. One of the goals of this week, now that we got the data back and we were able to frame our own thinking a little bit, we've asked all of the principals to go back to their staffs with some of these general ideas uh, to run them by them, but also to solicit feedback from educators about other ways that they think uh, we could do this. Um, should either you as a committee feel like we shouldn't apply for the waiver, or should you think we should apply for the waiver and DESE doesn't grant it, we do have to have a backup plan by January 19th. Um, so we are on a, a bit of a timeline. Um, I will, you know, just highlight this memo or letter 
is in your packet. Um, and we will also be letting families have access to this uh, tomorrow. Um, we'll be highlighting it for them. But, you know, in, in the waiver request, um, we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the reasons why we were requesting a waiver other than just, well, we think this is good um, or people are happy with it. But, you know, I think I appreciate where the state is at in looking across all of the schools. Uh, but I think one of the things, you know, we know is kind of the danger of always aggregating data is you don't really get a deep dive into some of the unique experiences of each individual district. And I think every district has some different needs. So, for example, with us, we've been working a lot with Challenge Success around ways that we can reduce stress. And those of you that have been on the committee for a long time know um you know, some of the work that's been done to look at the structures across the district in ways that we can minimize stress um, for our students, you know, and still keep high performance. Um, and I think we've actually been really successful at doing that. Um, we have, you know, had later start times. We've reduced homework loads. We have, you know, really thought deeply about, um, you know, no homework, uh, vacations, long weekends, things like that for our students. And I know there was a lot of fear um, that, you know, we would lose the performance edge with that. Um, you know, we are still um, the highest SAT scores in the state. We are still the highest AP scores in the state. Um, you know, and I'm not saying that because I think, you know, being number one is a badge of honor. I think more it's a recognition that you can actually reduce student stress and have high levels of performance at the same time. So, um, you know, I think we've really thought about that and we, we had those as priorities uh, when we created this remote schedule. And so, you know, we said that we wanted to keep plans realistic for everyone. We wanted to talk about the environment. We wanted to make sure we saw students as humans and not just as people who lost learning uh, over the course of the pandemic. Um, so just to keep that in mind, I already went through some of the stakeholder feedback, so I'm not gonna spend more time on that. Um, you know, it, it's really hard to just measure engagement um, but one of the measures that we did have was to take a look at our high school students' grades uh, from last year to this year, based on quarter one grades. So what was really interesting to us as we looked at that, um, both years, about 89% of all quarter one grades at the high school uh, were a B minus or better. Um, and that actually stayed consistent from last year to this year. Um, for students in the A range, so 90 or better, last year it was about 50% of grades given during first quarter were in that A range at the high school. This year it's actually 60% um, of all first quarter grades are in that A range at the high school. We also looked at grades below a 70 um, at our high school during first quarter. Last year about um, one and a half percent or so of grades uh, were below 70. And this year it's about 2.75 percent of the grades um, are below 70. So that's obviously an increase. What I will note is half of all the grades below 70 are in our remote learning program um, at the high school. So we need to think about that, um, especially where the remote learning program only makes up 15% of our student population. Um, so we need to think about something about how we're supporting some of the students there. Um, but I actually worry more about some of our remote, fully remote high school students than I do about the students in the hybrid program. Uh, based on some of that data. So I don't think we're, you know, experiencing this, you know, kind of the the disappearance of students that we're hearing about in the media, uh, necessarily at Acton Boxborough at the same rate that we're hearing about in some other places. And so I think based on that, we have a little bit different perspective as to why, you know, the types of things we might want to do with our asynchronous days. And then finally, you know, I think one of the we had a long debate about this as a leadership team uh, going into the hybrid program because we had considered uh, adding Zoom time on the asynchronous days very, very early on before we launched our program. And ultimately, we really felt that the in-person time with our kids was so sacred during the pandemic that we felt the need to really protect that. And we felt that if we divided teachers' attention between students who were, who were fully in person and students who were fully, you know, were on a screen, we were actually taking away a lot of that value and personalization that teachers can provide to students. And what we've anecdotally heard from a lot of our educators is that the opportunity 
to have classes of eight and nine in front of a, a teacher for a period of time is absolutely game changing in terms of the amount of individual attention they can give to kids when we're there. Um, and that was probably in all of my conversations with faculty, that's the number one piece of feedback teachers have really liked about you know, pandemic learning was this idea of really being able to know kids, know them in the small environment and being able to individualize instruction. Um, I felt that if we um, decide we're gonna start zooming into classes, we're actually gonna take away the one thing teachers feel like they really have a benefit of leverage for. So based on all of that, it's our recommendation um, that we would submit a waiver to DESE. DESE does not require a school committee vote to submit a waiver request um, or to make any changes to the program. However, um, I still believe that there's no greater policy decision than the educational program that we have for students. Um, and if we are going to submit a waiver for um, a learning time regulation, I actually think it's really important that the committee agree with that decision um, and vote to support that because I, I really value your opinions as parents, as community members, and as people who are connected with our community. So, um, you know, what you're looking at is pretty affirmative language, and that's because I shared with you um, a version of the memo that we will actually be sending to DESE if you choose to proceed with a waiver request. Um, if you do not choose to proceed with a waiver request, we will implement all of the strategies to meet those learning time regulations by January 19th. So you do have some choice in all of this. Um, but we as a leadership team um, felt pretty strongly to recommend for all of the reasons in this memo that we submit the waiver request. So, and I, I wish this was a meeting that we got to deliberate things for multiple meetings, um, but waivers are due no later than the 11th um, and then DESE reviews them. And if they decline the waiver, we still have to implement something by the 19th. Um, so DESE has not provided us a very long timeline to do that. So my apologies for the short deliberation window. So I will stop sharing the screen and I apologize that took so long to go through, but I wanted to, to be thorough for you and for our community as well. It's okay, Peter. You've only put us 45 minutes behind already. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Single-handedly. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, Amy. Yes, thank you for that. Um, I was wondering what does the asynchronous day check-in, what's it going to look like? Is it all the teachers? Is it uh, a counselor? What are you thinking about? I wish I could tell you exactly what it's going to look like, um, but again, you know, now that we had the data and we have been able to look at it and figure out as a leadership team uh, what we thought we needed to do with it, we actually are in the process now of trying to get a little bit more feedback from, from some of our educators. Um, you know, I, I think Andrew at the junior high has had a couple of different ideas, so he's not 100% ready to commit. Um, you know, the, the kids do have daily check-ins kind of with a homeroom or, um, you know, a, a standard educator every day, but he's also bantered around a couple of different ideas. So that's something he's working on. Um, the high school students do have an advisory class um, yeah. scheduled that would likely be the landing spot for this type of a check-in uh, because it's yeah. the most appropriate time. Um, so, you know, and we just don't have enough counselors to be able to Right. Uh, check-ins just using our counseling staff so we're really kind right. of you distributed yeah piece. that makes sense that makes sense um yeah my kids are all in remote so but i still i see this idea of having a check-in with them also it's i think it's a great idea uh kira thanks tessa um i i i like this plan i just wonder about um are there any are we missing any opportunities by taking by by applying for the waiver and taking it um, to provide extra services for um, students with special needs during their asynchronous days? Um, is is there? I, I see all of this data, um, but I'm just curious to know um, if if families with special needs um, are, were were uh, what's the word I'm looking for. Were, were pulled out from some of this data? Did they, did they, are they in sync with everything that we say or are they, are, is, are their satisfaction, dissatisfaction levels um, different and, and does that matter for this? Um, 
yeah. that's my first question. And then my, my second question is about um, sustainability for teachers. So we know that teachers have been exhausted. Um, and so I'm glad that teachers and educators are expressing general satisfaction. Um, but I'm, I'm curious to know whether or not um, there was anything about their exhaustion level and sustainability um, for the energy that they've been giving for the last couple of months. And if that matters for the waiver. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the, I, I'll just start by saying the survey was really specific to the proposed regulations for DESI. So we didn't ask a lot of extra questions other than the snowy question. Um, so, you know, in terms of students with disabilities, unfortunately, from a DESI perspective, um, if even if we provide extra time for students with disabilities, if it doesn't, if it isn't required for all students, it doesn't count for time on learning for this. Um, so, you know, and I can say that because I had a conversation with the associate commissioner. Uh, we just launched a new junior high school program this week where we were able to bring in um, 75 additional high needs students on Wednesdays for in-person learning as opposed to remote learning. Um, you know, and, you know, Andrew and his team really thought carefully about the, you know, how many students they could bring in, um, how to make that work. The high school is actually looking at something very similar on asynchronous days. Um, they're still in their planning phase. The size of the school makes it a little bit more challenging in some ways um, and some of the mix of grade levels. Um, and at the elementary level, um, actually a lot of our services are being offered on asynchronous days to students. Um, and the reason we ended up starting with that model um, where some of the services were on asynchronous days is we didn't want kids coming in in a hybrid model um, and, and, you know, coming in two days a week and then getting pulled out of that class um, as soon as they stepped in. I mean, sometimes there's an inevitable conflict where we have to do something, but um, our goal was to try and actually provide some of the services on the asynchronous days if possible. So some of our special educators are already doing Excuse me. Um, we are also looking at ways that we can, you know, support some of our students with disabilities at the elementary level as well. Um, trying to bring in additional students, things like that. Um, I know our principals are always thinking about how they can fit additional students in on a four day schedule as opposed to a two day schedule. Um, if they feel like they need that, we've just had a conversation with Juliana about that recently, um, where she identified a couple of students. Um, you know, in her case, the, the problem was the bus they needed was already full. Uh, so we've been working through that challenge um, about how to how to navigate that. But I think we'll be able to resolve that because um, we don't want buses to be our, our barrier to kids coming in. So just uh, does that answer that question? It does. Yes. Yeah. And then again, we didn't ask the questions about kind of educator burnout of this survey. Um, you know, it is real. There was actually a great piece in the New York Times um about educator burnout um that was really poignant I'll, I'll see if i can remember to send it to everyone uh but it actually also cited trying to teach remote and in-person students at the same time as the number one source of burnout for teachers mm. yeah jenny um thanks i was also going to ask about um uh, families with with kids with special needs because I just have heard so many, um, you know, anecdotal accounts of the struggles of those families. It's just heartbreaking and I recognize all of the work that's being done, um, but I, I would, you know, would not be in support of this waiver if it was going to, um, you know, possibly deprive those families of a little more, more time. So I'm glad to hear that it doesn't. Um, and, and then with respect to, to general education students, um, you know, I have kids in the high school and it, it's, um, they're, they're kind of like little college students now, you know, with their days on campus and their days where they have to kind of manage everything on their own, which, you know, might be good training, but it's certainly, you know, not something, uh, you know, certainly has its challenges. And you know, every time the rules change or they go from, you know, from my perspective and I've, I've talked to other community members about this, to, you know, from hybrid to remote or, you know, something changes with schedules, it just, it just feels extremely disruptive because everything is so bananas and, um, you know, it's hard to just absorb even small changes, I feel like now, because 
um, you, you, you finally feel like you have the ground under your feet and you know what's going on and then you can get blindsided. So I don't support um, changes because Desi thinks it's a good idea in any way, shape or form. So I would support this waiver um, with that caveat about special needs. Yeah, you know, and, and I would love to, to know more about that too, but you know, one of the worries I have for our, our students with disabilities, um, you know, by providing the services, you know, again, we, we already provide some pre-scheduled services on the asynchronous days when we're able to, um, but if we change midstream, um, whether or not students get more education is going to be, especially for younger kids, is going to be so highly dependent on family availability. Um, we know that, you know, my wife teaches in a district where, you know, there are kids in child care programs and they do try to, they tried to zoom in, but the child care program couldn't get the kids to the right place at the right time. Um, it was just beyond what they could manage. So, you know, it, I, I don't know. It, it's, I, I wish we had more information before we started the school year about some of the goals with this, because then we could have had a, a plan going in that everyone knew. Um, but I do think it's kind of challenging to try and be changing things on people in the street. Evelyn? Yeah, um, I apologize in advance. I'm going in and out. My internet is not being too cooperative tonight. But um, I wanted to ask um, Peter if there will be opportunity at some point to increase the in-person days for at least the high school students to three days instead of two days. And maybe that would create a little bit of consistency because to what Jeannie said, a little bit of a change in schedule can sort of throw them off schedule. And even with everything going on, a few of them have winter sports. And so that then just throws a wrench into everything that is going on. So um, to the extent that we can minimize the disruption will be good, but I think if it, and it does seem, you know, we're hearing, I personally hear in the community that people are probably open to the number of days in person, and it may not be a bad idea to explore the possibility of adding a day or so, even if it was a half day, and that probably will help with the in the check-ins and that. I, I think that's a great point. That was actually something that um, when I called Desi the first time to get a little bit more information about this, they actually suggested, but one of the things I, I pointed out to them is this is actually about the live learning time. And, you know, the, the Desi person actually originally suggested that, you know, maybe we alternate Wednesdays for our two cohorts, you know, and that might be a way of increasing some of that time. But I pointed out that the problem with that is you're also then doubling the asynchronous time for kids because now the kids, right now on Wednesday, all students are live with the teacher. But if you alternate the Wednesdays, then, you know, one week they're, they're live, but then the next week they're asynchronous and they don't have any connection to the teacher. And it actually reduced our live instruction. Um, I love the idea, but it would actually work against us in terms of the DESI requirement. Um, all right. It looks like we, oh, oh, sorry, Diane, you had your hand up a minute when I went. I did. So, um, I, I mean, I was going to make a motion, um, um, but I, I, I just have a quick, um, observation and, and perhaps a question. Um, so I think that, you know, when I was, I, I was able to, to go to part of the, the, the board of education meeting on this and the entire impetus for it was the impact on mental health and that this would be providing more consistency, but there was flexibility given. It wasn't, didn't necessarily have to be time on learning. I mean, it was very clear that it wasn't like they were buying into this idea that more Zoom means more engagement. In fact, you know, there are plenty of people there to point out to the board that that's absolutely not true. And so I, I think that what we're doing, you know, lines up, like aligns really, really well with what the needs of and the desires of our community is and what, it, what we can do in terms of capacity, in terms of staffing, so, I mean, I, I think um, it was a lot of work to do this and pull the data together. And I really appreciate having the data. I think it's the right thing to do for us. Um, do you anticipate receiving um, the blessing <laughs> if we ask for a, a, rep, a, a waiver? Or do you, do, you, uh, perceive, do you think that we're gonna get pushback? You know, right now, the message I got was Desi is not really sure of the standard they're gonna use um, to decide whether or not they approve a waiver. Um, 
So my, my feedback was that makes it challenging for us to know what the standard is either. Um, and, you know, I, but as frustrating it is for me because it's very frustrating. I also have to have a level of empathy that they've never done this either. Um, and this is new to them. So um, it, it's challenging for us. The, I would agree with you. You know, one of the challenges, particularly at the high school is, you know, unless you're thinking about that advisory period, there's no other mechanism in a high school to increase like connections um, unless you're just zooming into classes. Um, and, you know, the, the feeling was that just burns kids out. Um, and we kind of heard that from Rick earlier, um, that if you're trying to Zoom every day or Zooming for six hours a day is just burnout. Um, so that that was our, our thinking. So can I make a motion, Tessa? You can. I, I am aware. I don't want the person that's in the audience to think that I have forgotten about them. Go ahead and make a motion and we can still continue discussion. Okay, so I move that um, this, the school committee support the district's request for a waiver from Desi on structured learning time. Second. Second. Okay, and then John had his hand up and then Yevin had his hand up and then we have someone in the audience. So John, go right ahead. I um, wanted to uh, say, you know, I'm very pleased that, you know, Peter brought this forward to us so that we could enthusiastically, hopefully, endorse the idea of a waiver. And as Peter pointed out, and I don't want it to get lost, just because we've asked for a waiver, and even if we get a waiver, that doesn't mean that as some of these other ideas are explored, we can't make changes to our program that we think that it's better. The other comment that I wanted to make is, um, thank you, Peter, for working very hard to put an end to average at a number of points in your presentation as you banded the groups, you know, and particularly pointed out the impact on some of the student groups. And so no matter what we do and how hard we try, you know, to make sure that every student has a good experience this year, um, once again, you know, we're going to come to the end of this year and we're going to find that there are specific groups of students, you know, have, that have not made the progress that we wanted to, them to make. And so I wanted to very specifically request that when we look at the FY22 budget, you know, that FY22 budget is trying to support things where, you know, for whatever reason, you know, gaps have occurred this year, and we're going to do something in FY22 to try to close those gaps. Uh, Yevon? Oh, thank you, Tessa. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Thank you, Peter, for your presentation and for collecting the data, sending out the survey. And uh, also, it's good to make up uh, the backup plan. So uh, that's, I like that. But uh, uh, regardless about the that is going to waive or grant the waiver or not, uh, I think we are still ought to address the the, the reality that uh, only thirty percent of the high high school students are satisfied with this. Right. So, yeah. do you have any idea about this? So the high school, I, I think they actually might have launched it um, already. They have an extensive student engagement survey um, that they either have just launched or are about to launch with kids, um, you know, to really dig into um, what kids think is really working for them um, instructionally, you know, schedule wise, what doesn't work. Um, so they're looking really deeply at that. Um, they don't have the data back yet, obviously, because it's, it's, it, it's very fresh. Um, but that's something that, that they're going to follow up on and take a look at, you know, and then the other thing is a district that we're going to be looking at is the amount of asynchronous learning that we are providing, because that was a, a clear message from our families, uh, very consistently. Too. So we're going to be thinking about that, but I think one of the things of asynchronous learning is it gives a little bit more freedom to when that can take place. Angie. Yeah. Thanks Peter. And thanks Tessa. So I like Jenny that I'm very supportive of this um, this recommendation, and I also at the same time I hear the need of in person, especially for the special needs students. So I, I was wondering if um, even if the support that the uh, because as you stated that the in person is what everybody are looking for. So I was wondering that if there's will be any consideration to have more in-person, especially for the special needs students? Um, 
Yes. So, uh, you know, as I said, Andrew just launched a program at the junior high school to bring more students in. The high school is in the planning stages of trying to launch something um, to bring in some of the higher needs students on the asynchronous days. And then at elementary school, we continue to try and expand the number of students who are in a four day program um, as we identify more students who would benefit from that. So that's that's certainly something that we're continuing to do. But not at a high school level? Uh, we already have a number of students in an a four-day program. Um, and so when I essentially say that we're looking to bring kids in on the asynchronous days, that takes them from a two-day to a four-day program. Okay, thank you. All right, so Peter, we have two people in the audience that have their hands raised. Yeah, um, and so just as a reminder, if you can identify yourself, street and town, please. So Kate... Yes, hi, Peter. Um, my name is Kate, and I'm from Mohegan Road in Acton. I appreciate your work in preparing the presentation this evening about this data that you collected. I have a kindergartner and am new to the district, actually. Um, it's a, an honor to be here, and so far, my family has found our, a home in Acton and feel very you know, happy to be here. Um, one question I have about the waiver, and um, I had it early on in this discussion, and, and appreciate that um, you mentioned the consideration for Wednesdays. Um, I had been thinking about the kind of the rotation of the cohorts on Wednesday as a, a way to increase to what I calculated to maybe be about 35 hours of in-person learning. If, if you think about seven hours a day on the, the two days a week and every other Wednesday. Um, and then, you know, you, you, you put out there that it would decrease the, the synchronous remote instruction on the, on the Wednesday lost. Um, I, I have to encourage or ask if if this could, as an idea, stay on the table. As in our particular instance, and again, I'm, I'm talking from a kindergartner. Our remote Wednesdays is a one forty minute Zoom. Um, my daughter loves her teacher. It's, it's nothing about. Um, it's, it's a Herculean effort right now to educate kindergartners and and really all students of any age. And I understand this, the stress and the tax on our on the teachers. And I can tell you that I will gladly give up our Wednesday 40-minute Zoom every other week for her to be in person every other week. So I and encourage the, the committee and your administrative team to consider um, the impact that that every other week would do to the mental health of our student population. And that's all students. Um, and, and frankly, the learning outcomes for students at all levels. So thank you. Um, I, I do appreciate, I am a school leader. I understand what you are um, are dealing with and this is a, a really tough time. And um, and I, I ask you as a committee, if, if this is what we're putting, we're asking for a waiver, um, you know, in, in some ways this, this could be a, a backup plan for that would still maybe require a waiver, but may, may be incredibly impactful to our students. So thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Kate. Um, I think it's, sorry, I'm having trouble. I believe Amy. Uh, yeah, hi, Peter. Hi, everyone. My name is Ami Sanieri, actually. Sorry, Ami. That's okay. We're new to Acton and we love it here. Um, my husband and I are both high school teachers and we have two kids at Miriam Elementary. Um, they're having a great time. They love going to school. Every day they come home with great stories and we're really um, so, so pleased with some of the programs um, that they get to do, including the Book Buddies program on Wednesday. Um, we're really super happy with what's happening. My question is, we are both in high schools closer to the city who have been fully remote and we are both now being asked to come in um, to teach um, in different situations. I'm going to be asked to be a part of a hybrid. I work with English language learners um, and I believe my husband's going to be asked to come in for four days. I'm, my question for you is just for teachers who have kids um, are there some accommodations? Are there some things that can be offered to try and help us as teachers who are trying to help support our own kids um, as well as our students? Is, is there something that um, 
we can um, look for to try and figure out how to balance um, our kids' education and our students' education um, as far as support with maybe more than two days in the, in the classroom setting. Yeah, I, um, if you also want to email me, I can maybe talk a little bit more about your situation and how we can do that. Um, we, you know, at the beginning of the year, we started a community education program um, where, you know, we actually provide some child care in each school. Yep. On the we have. And they help them connect. Um, but I think I need to know a little bit about more what, what your needs are and then connect you with the right person to be able to, to think that through. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. There are districts I know that do provide the support specifically for educators, and we do have a kid in the community ed program, and they're doing great stuff. It's just now that we up the ante and we go into our own classroom settings, I'm just wondering if there's support for, for people just like us, not just our situation. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Judy? First of all, I want to say thank you, Peter, and to the school committee for doing a great job in coordinating all this with the COVID situation. Um, and I, I had a, just, a, I, I understand the waiver piece. Um, I just don't want something to get lost that you're talking about within the waiver piece uh, with regards to the asynchronous learning days in the elementary schools. And uh, the piece that I don't want to get lost is, um, at least in my son's grade and his school, there isn't an, a check-in on the asynchronous days at all with the kids. Um, and I just feel like maybe that needs to be more consistent across the district. So uh, I know you're talking about it, an hour a day or check-ins or yep. first time with the teachers. That's not happening in my kids, my son's school. So I just want to maybe after this all the, the desi waiver takes place and everything else it's just to make sure that it's consistent across the district yeah absolutely and if you could send me an email too that i want to be able to follow up with the principal okay okay thank you and so i see someone else i'm going to ask you to just identify yourself it looks like maybe someone from uh, the children's behavioral health initiative um, but I don't see your actual name, so I apologize. I'm not using your name, but if you could just let us know who you are. I'm so sorry. This is Amanda Toby from Mohegan Road in Acton. I, um, I must be logged in under my professional Zoom account. There's just too many accounts to manage. Yeah. Um, sorry about that. So just a clarification, um, you've alluded to it in various meetings about, um, a full return to in-person, that's everyone, everybody's goal. I, I love hearing your sentiment, but you know, just in terms of the teacher vaccination, so is that the bona fide plan that teachers have to be vaccinated before we're returning to more in-person days? You know, I think that's the most realistic path um, to, to really getting to that. You know, if, I, I think if we had public health data that was a lot more supportive. Um, I know we haven't had transmission in the schools, but we've also maintained a really strict protocol around six feet of distance. Um, you know, the I, I think our most realistic path right now is the vaccinations. Um, you know, and then even then, I think we're going to end up having to work with a number of families because there might be some families that are still going to be uncomfortable with less than six feet. Um, you know, because that, that's been something we've heard a little bit about too. So, um, you know, right now that does seem like it's the most realistic path. I do know educators are, you know, on the that tier two of priority. So sometime between February and April um, to be vaccinated. But I, you know, I'm also, you know, hopeful that we got to watch the public health numbers too. I think now is a really challenging time to be thinking about bringing kids back because the, the health numbers are so tough that it's hard to justify why we would go less than six feet right now. Are, are there metrics or data that, I mean, when you talk about the vaccinations, we're, that's, that's next school year, right? That for any implications on the schedule. So for this school year, any, so it sounds like unless something changes dramatically, this is the plan for in-person learning what we have? I think there's an opportunity to talk about um, 
a potential return this year. The vaccination schedule, it, you know, could very well be such that it does provide an opportunity to think about this year. Um, you know, it's, it wouldn't just be so easy as to say, okay, teachers have been vaccinated, everyone can come back, because I think we have to, you know, figure out some plans for various families, um, because kids will not have vaccines this year. Um, you know, they haven't, they're not even on the the list of anyone right now. Um, and the vaccines are only available to people 16 and over uh, because it hasn't been tested. So, uh, you know, it, I think anything is a challenge to switch, but I, I do think there's, you know, the potential for an opportunity of something this year. I just don't have a timeline for that. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, Judy? Judy already spoke. Oh, Judy. Okay, that's right. Judy did. Sorry, Judy. Um, uh, John. Hello. Uh, I'm from 100 Picnic Street on Boxborough. Okay. So... That is, there's no one else. Um, thank you for, I hope you kicked that person out. All right. Um, did, so in case anyone didn't hear that, that was, there was some profanity laced music in there and I hope I, that person identified themselves in an address. Um, so I hope that we um, follow up with that. Okay. Did anyone else on the committee have a question? I know that we have a motion on the floor and um, and it was seconded. No. Right, then we'll do a roll call vote. Um, okay, sorry. Yevin? Yes. Kira? Yes. Amy? Yes. Evelyn? Yes. Adam? Yes. Jenny? Yes. Uh, John? Yes. Angie? Yes. Nora? Yes. Diane? Yes. And myself? Yes. And I just want to acknowledge that this committee has already stated that we are not going to stand for any more of this uh, harassment of members of our committee. I, I don't, I mean, that obviously wasn't a, a security issue because that person identified themselves, whether that's a real name or not, but um, it's very disturbing. And I'm sorry, Kira and Evelyn, that this is happening again. I, I just don't, I have no words for what is going on. And to be honest, I, I don't even, I didn't hear any of it. Uh, something must have happened on my end, but, um, you know, my apologies. Well, it will be on the tape <laughs> recorded. Yep. All right. If, any, if anyone else wants to say something, please raise your hand and, and go right ahead. I don't, I don't want to silence anybody and I don't, I don't want to brush over this because it's disgusting, but I also don't want to give it more airtime than, than, it, than is needed. So I, Absolutely, I don't want to silence anyone that wants to say something. Kira, did you want to say something? No, but I do want to, you know, it's, first of all, it's been two hours anyway. Can we just, can we just take the minute? And then also, I, you know, again, I, I just think, yeah. you know, there are, there are um, 74 people in town. Um, you know, I just want to, I, I, you know, I just want to be really clear for those who are here that there are, you know, that, that somebody chose <laughs> to call to public servants in this town, um, the N-word, um, again, in, in our capacity of service. And I just want you to know that. So we just talked about neighbors. Two of your neighbors were just called that in our capacity of service. So, uh, you know, I wanna go to the grocery store. I'm, I wanna raise my children here. I wanna serve your children. Um, mm. Yeah. So, yeah, I want yeah, the break. I agree with you, Kara. I think, you know, it's gotten to a point where I don't even want to give it airtime, but if we want to treat each other with respect, 
it's it's both sides and if this doesn't stop this is how people you know say things that others don't appreciate so i didn't hear so, anything i don't know it, if there's so, did, but so so the the caller that called in identified themselves identified an address whether that was their address or not and played an audio that included the n word mm -hmm. and so that that is what I don't know, those of us that could hear it, I don't know the audio. Kira, did you want to take a five minute recess? Is that what you're asking? I, it would just be really, it's been two hours anyway. I would just, that, that's nice. like take five minutes. Absolutely. And thank you, Peter, for kicking the press. You know, I, we don't deserve that. Not, none of us yeah. on, in this group, no, nobody Kira and I, I think it's disrespectful no. to everyone on this team, you know? Absolutely. But it's good that people are witnessing. I just want people to witness, bear witness, uh, you know, bear happens. witness. Yeah. So, uh, you know, do all the things and talk about neighbors and talk about how something important happened and that we, we you know, we want to talk about our feelings and we want to talk about how sensitive this was. And then let's talk. But we also have to bear witness to the abuse. Um, and that's what this is. Um, so I'm going to take five minutes and then know. I'll be back Here, to work. We'll, we'll all take five minutes that's together. Fine. Take a five minute recess. I don't know what time it is. It's 847. 848. 
And just like yesterday, democracy gonna keep going and our body's gonna keep working. That's right. That's right. She is right. All right. I gave That's everyone one light. I gave everyone one more minute. Yes, sir, can I say something? Uh, yep. Yeah, just, just, just impossible. I don't know. And well, for me, I don't. I didn't hear the word. I heard music, and I thought it's a kid play by accident. But yeah, after you explain it, it's just impossible. I just want to say that. Yeah. Uh, so that everyone knows, we are not going to entertain any public participation for the rest of the meeting. So if, if members of the public that are watching have comments or questions, they can email the committee and we will respond to them that way. But we are not going to uh, call on anybody else from, from the uh, public uh, for the rest of the meeting tonight. Okay, so it looks like at least most of us are back. I'm not counting, so I think we are. <laughs> um, all right, so so we, we voted and we've moved past that. And so now we have the first read of um, next year's calendar, which Peter <laughs> gets to keep speaking because Marie is not here tonight. So he will uh, cover the, the options that we have before us. Okay, and you know, I'm just going to say I am so sorry that that happened. Um, in all honesty, I'm not sure everyone heard the same thing um, when we recognized that person. Um, all I heard was silence, and then they disappeared. Um, and then, so I don't know what's going on with the recording or not. Um, but I, it sounds like Nora had the same problem. I don't know what other people heard as well, um, but obviously unacceptable. Um, Calendar, uh, I'm going to share my screen for a moment here. Um, so there are, there are two versions of the school calendar in your packet. Um, and we, we put in two different versions this year because we didn't personally have a strong preference. There were some benefits and drawbacks to each version. Um, one thing we noticed um, as we were looking at the calendar, um, I believe it's Rosh Hashanah falls um, on the day after Labor Day um, next year. And so, you know, one version that we had um, open school on September 8th and the other version that we had um, open school on September 30th. And I could just point to a couple benefits and drawbacks and we can take a little bit of feedback. Um, the version on September 30th, I think from a traditional, when do we want to start the school year? Um, excuse me, August 30th, not September 30th. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> we, we traditionally would want to start around that date. Um, but that what that does is it gives us, you know, a week of four days. And then including the weekend, we would end up having five days off. And then we would have a three-day week. And then a couple days, then another three days of school, another day off, and then the Friday uh, is a holiday as well. So um, we were a little worried that it was kind of a broken beginning of the year um, from a continuity. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't want to interrupt. Um, Peter, could you just make it a little bit bigger? I Some of us have not the best eyesight. Is that better? Yes. yes. Thank you. Okay, so starting on the 30th, we get a four-day week, and then a five-day weekend, then a three-day week, another weekend, and then three days, the holiday, and then um, the Friday we're in. So it was kind of a broken up beginning of the year from an instructional standpoint. So we put out an alternative um, look of the calendar where we actually didn't come back until after Rosh Hashanah. Um, so we would actually start on the 8th. Um, so we would have, you know, the 8th, 9th, 10th, the weekend, 
13, 14, 15, and, and it provides a little bit more continuity. Um, one is obviously an early start, the other is later. The difference in terms of the end of the year, um, if we start later, the projected end date is the 21st, which is a little later than we would like to traditionally um, end the school year, especially knowing that snow days could be back in play next year. Um, and the 15th would be the end date if we start on August 30th. So those are the two options, and we're just kind of happy to hear some feedback. Um, then we'll bring it back, revise it, um, and come back to the committee. Right, well, oh, hands out went up really fast. Go, sorry, what else, Peter? Um, you know, and you know, based on the time, you can either discuss the feedback, or if you want Tessa, people can also email the feedback to me or Beth, and we can compile it and then you know, bring that forward, but um, it's up, I'll leave that up to you. I would say, I think that tonight is, is a night to, to bring up legitimate questions and ask them now. And if you have um, something to point out that may be helpful in other people's deliberations, but please listen to each other. And I don't, this doesn't need to be the night where all like 11 of us weigh it, I think, unless, you know, so let's just listen for, for what different people's comments are and try not to repeat. Kira? I have a snow day question for option two. So, so given what we've we've been doing this year, and we know that students aren't really delighted by it, but if you know if we if we go with that later start, um, and then we say, hey, you know, there's no there's no snow days, or there's only one snow day, so we can hold we can hold that twenty first. Is that an option? Um, we don't have any information from Desi as to whether they're going to allow remote learning days next year or not, in lieu of traditional snow days. Um, you know, the, right now they're allowing it on a one year temporary basis because of the pandemic um, and the fact that schools are already kind of in this mode. So um, it's too early to project whether we'd be able to take advantage of it again. Adam? Yeah, uh, I'm a proponent for starting earlier. Um, we all know that the beginning of the school year is disjointed no matter what, um, whether or not we're in school for four days and take five days off and then have a broken first few days. I think that that's, um, that's a better option than running the risk of going later. Um, we've had that, we had that challenge a couple of years ago. Um, our teachers are on contract, I believe until the end of June. So if it becomes a, a real nor'easter winter and we've got seven or eight snow days we come up against the, the teacher contract end date. So I would be more in favor of uh, starting on August 30th than starting later. Evelyn? So um, piggybacking on um, Kiara's question, if it was possible to use some of the, uh, you know, what would be learned from doing things remotely these days, um, to support a snow day and not cancel the snow day per se, and that would help us end the school year earlier, I would be supportive of the second option so that it's not so broken up. But the real reason why I wanted to speak up about this color is that I do want to sow a seed for the spirit of diversity and inclusion that we think about adding uh, Muslim holiday on our calendar. I think, you know, and I want to disclose <laughs> that I have a Catholic Muslim family and my kids are raised Muslim, but I think there's also a number of Muslim, you know, the growing and growing Muslim population in Acton and Boxborough. And I think just given what we're, <laughs> we're seeing and the intolerance these are things that we have to do. And, you know, I think it will support, it, it will. Oh, Revlin Gross. Mm. Will it come back? Will it not? It's easy for people to think about. Evelyn, just so I can be clear, are you suggesting we add a, a holiday as a day off? Or are you just suggesting a, a recognition? Yes. If we need to give up one holiday to add another, we should do that. I mean, I'm a Christian, I'm a Catholic. We have how many of them? We have Christmas, we have Easter, we have this, we have that. 
we should think about a way to incorporate some. Oh, your internet keeps going out. So what I'm going to say to that is what I have said before, which is in a year where we decide that we're going to have a wider um, calendar discussion. I don't know if Evelyn can hear me or not, and I will repeat myself again if I need to be. Um, is that when, in a year when we have a wider calendar discussion that we again possibly consider that? But before Evelyn was on the committee, and before Kira was on the committee, and Yevon, um, and maybe even Nora, we had quite a lengthy calendar discussion where there was an entire calendar subcommittee, and we considered all kinds of things in terms of um, calendar. Uh, considerations. And one of the things with holidays that needs to be understood is you can't have, you can't take a day off as a holiday just because it's a holiday. There's an, there has to be a reason that it impacts your school population. And so the reason that the holidays that we have off currently as days off of school are because they would have a significant impact on either the student or teacher population if we held school and it, we have to consider um, substitutes and things like that. And I only know this because I sat on the calendar subcommittee and went through all of this for a long time. And it was why we came to the, um, you know, why we added holidays to the days of recognition in terms of not um, giving homework and not uh, giving tests. And I understand that that is not always a, at the high school carried out and that that's a whole separate issue but i do want you to understand that as far as being a public school district we are not allowed to add a calendar day off because of a religious or cultural holiday it has to have some impact on um on our on our on our day-to-day -day operations i don't want to sow the seed for now until we have that conversation because i do think there is an impact i think we have a growing population and it would have an impact it's something we should i don't we, we, i don't want to solve today i think it's something we should think about for when it is ready to be discussed noted thank you john yeah, I just wanted to follow up um, on that so that while we're collecting information, um, is it the May 3rd holiday that we should be thinking about of the different things that we might do? Evelyn? Yeah. John, I'm sorry, my internet is, is fading in and out. I didn't hear your question completely. Could you please repeat it? So if we're going to... Um, consider in the future a Muslim holiday is the day that we would first consider the May 3rd holiday? It will be one of the Eid holidays. So I don't know which is the May 3rd one. I'm not looking at the calendar right now, but I oh, know that yeah. logistically it's hard because it's usually decided by the moon and when the moon comes in and all that, but the other districts that are doing it and we can if we wanted to do it, we can think through the best way to do it so that it doesn't it doesn't have to it, it's it's not impacting our operations. That's what I mean. We'll set it ahead of time. But that's something that we can think about. It will be one of the E, whether the E is filter or E in at her. And the only one that happens during the school year this year is E Delta Terra. But 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 note it and and we will consider it when we take a longer look at the calendar. Is there anyone else that had a, a strong feeling one way or another about, I know I said we weren't going to all give our opinion, so I'm sure that everybody has an opinion of, of which, but anyone that wanted to add anything to the discussion. Otherwise, you can send things to Peter um, and Marie for consideration. Okay. Seeing nothing else, we'll keep moving. Um, okay, so... This, so we will we'll look at the final calendar and vote on the 21st. Um, the Student Opportunity Act plan. Peter, this is just a first read and we've changed. It was going to be a vote tonight, but after um, discussing with Peter, I felt that it was okay if we send this in late because given the timeline that Desi gave us, it was incredibly tight and not so much time to complete something that we could that needed some consideration, I think, from, from the school committee and maybe other stakeholders. So um, go ahead, Peter. Yeah, so, you know, one, I, I'm just gonna start by apologizing for something on this in terms of the timeline. Um, so we, we got a reminder in mid-December from Desi that 
this was due on January 15th. Um, and, you know, which was about the same time that everything else was taking place. And so I have racked my brain about when this came out and I have nothing in my notes from my various meetings with the commissioner uh, that take place on a weekly basis. But I did find it in an email that they sent on August 24th that this was due along with a number of other items related to the reopening of school. Um, I've just since gone back and found that. So I'm going to apologize. The timeline piece I'm going to own um, and say that that's on me because um, it, it certainly should have been something that was done sooner and, and with a lot more input. Um, the other element that, you know, I want to recognize, you know, we, with the Student Opportunity Act, uh, you know, a lot of, just to give a little background on it, it was obviously something we discussed at length last year where there was a bill passed at the state level to finally fund public schools in a way that was more equitable um, and kind of a distribution of resources. With the idea that districts would gain additional funds, the funds for Act and Boxboro, you know, last year we were projecting that it was probably around year five or six that we would start to see funds from this. Um, you know, Dave thinks it's probably longer, if ever, based on some of the declining enrollment that we've seen um, in our district. So we're really unsure when we're going to see money or if we will ever actually see money out of this. Um, however, um, we do have a responsibility of picking what, you know, target area or more um, that we want to commit to improving outcomes for our students. So, you know, when we did this, um, we had known for a while that we wanted to focus on literacy. Um, DESE has given target areas, um, you know, and one of their recommended target areas was early literacy, and we've done a substantial amount of work in that area. And one of the things that you have to do is you have to identify specific subgroups that you're trying to improve outcomes for. And so we actually pulled our data from MCAS and also uh, for um, our early work this year with iReady. And the three student populations that we are consistently most underserving were the ones listed in the, the document. Um, and I'm, I'm just pulling it up. But essentially, the and we, we provided some of the data for the rationale there, which, you know, we're, we're vastly underserving Black students, we're vastly underserving our Hispanic Latino students, and we're vastly underserving our students who are economically disadvantaged. Um, our EL students and students with disabilities were the next two categories um, in that data, but the data nowhere um, was at the same level that we were underserving these three populations. So, you know, we wanted to make sure we were targeting to these three populations. Um, clearly, from a strategic standpoint, the work that we're doing around literacy is much more encompassing um, because we actually recognize that our literacy work also has significant, um, you know, areas for growth in terms of students with disabilities um, and our EL population. Um, but we had chose to try and be very narrow in the focus on this. Um, we have gotten some feedback feeling like that left out some of the work that we needed to do with students with disabilities. And that's certainly something we're going to be looking at over the course of the next week. But what we wanted to do tonight is bring it how we had originally written it, seek some feedback from you um, and, you know, um, you know, be able to also allow the public to have a period of, of, of input into this. So if there are people in the public, obviously we're not doing the public comment um, for the remainder of this meeting, um, but people can certainly send um, us feedback. And I would ask that you email Beth Petter and myself, and we'll send that out you know, to families as well. Um, so they know what the email process is gonna look like. And then we will incorporate any feedback we receive from you tonight. Um, and then I'll obviously bring that back with the revisions for the next meeting. Um, originally, we were, you know, feeling like we were tied to Desi's timeline. And again, I gave you the reasoning that's on me um, for having missed that email um, from August. And I, I just sincerely apologize for that. But, um, you know, with that said, we've kind of decided that we'd rather have a good plan than just rush it and meet, meet Desi's timeline. So um, it's, it's not like they can withhold the SOE money from us. Um, I'm not, not so worried about that. So with that said, you know, you, you have the plan in front of you, it's in the packet and we're, we're happy to take some feedback. Yeah. Is there an opportunity for the, um, for the family, the DEI family advisory to, um, 
to read this and chat about it before before we do anything else as well. When, uh, I don't have our calendar in front of us. When is our next meeting? February 1st. So that's too late, yeah. So we could still send it to them. What we could do, in all honesty, if we want, we could submit something, you know, and then choose to revise it and resubmit. Um, I don't think anyone would have an issue with that. I think now that we're also taking some time, we could also do the same thing with our CPAC. Um, and we could think about some other different groups that we want to engage for this. Yeah, I think that engaging with those families would be really, really impactful and, yep. and very important. Diane. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate um, the extension of the deadline um, and the fact that this has now become a first read. Um, so I am the liaison to the CPAC and they met um, last night and they, um, they had concerns about this. So I'm also happy to hear that this would be floated to them and as well as to other stakeholder groups. I'm going to put a plug um, really quickly. Um, I did write something. So um, I'm going to put a plug in for adding students with disabilities. I feel like um, I'm going to acknowledge right now that this is an unfunded mandate for this district. Um, but this is a high, this is kind of a high stakes document. Um, it's setting priorities. Um, it's asking us to allocate resources to address inequities for our, really our most vulnerable student populations who we are elected to serve. Um, it, and and I, I, I don't understand why we would leave students with disabilities out of this when the data is, is there to support the inclusion um, their inclusion in it and when there is so much at stake for them. So the SOA asks us to say to ourselves, we hold ourselves accountable for turning this inequity around. And, and it's for that reason I feel that that we really should only endorse this unless with the addition of students with disabilities. As it stands, I feel like for me, it's I'm like turning my back on Acton Box Row third graders who are struggling to read right now and who will continue to struggle to read next year and the year after that until the district is able to implement a literacy program that aligns with what we now know works. And I, I just want to acknowledge that Deb did a fantastic job developing a framework for literacy instruction, um, but the work of implementation is in its infancy and it is a formidable challenge in a district with a long history of allegiance to instructional routines that prioritized comprehension at the expense of building strong foundational literacy skills and it's gonna take time and training to turn that around. So um, I'm just gonna urge my colleagues on the school committee to um, think about that and uh, consider ad adding students with disabilities as a target subgroup to the cohort of black, Latinx and economically disadvantaged students currently in the plan. Thank you. Adam. Yeah, I guess I have a question and then a comment that the question is to sort of a bit of a clarification. So we, Diane mentioned this is an unfunded mandate and we've heard from Dave that the funding that we would receive from this wouldn't necessarily come for a number of years from now. So I guess my question is the, the plan that we have to put forward here, is this asking us to um, put attention towards these items now, or is this asking us what we do when we start to get the funding from the Student Opportunity Act monies? Um, and then uh, the, the, the second comment I have is, if it's possible, I would say that we put something in now that is a, a view of our district's needs now, but in three, four years time, when we actually start to get funding for this, we would look to revise it. And, and third comment is, I, while we're talking about those students who are underserved in first through third grade, um, again, students with disabilities may have those challenges following up way past third grade through to their adult lives. And so I wonder if we're, we're missing that part of the, the puzzle. Any? So pretty much everything Diane said, um, you know, I, I feel like I have all the same concerns as, as she does. Super. <laughs> Angie? Yeah, so I agree with Adam said, which is um, because the timeline is undecided and the uh, uh, demographic and everything, the data will change. I was wondering if this will be revised based on the new data when we get the money. 
So this is, I believe what we're submitting is a two year uh, version of this, and then we would have to update it after that. Okay, John? The, um, you know, one of the things that we got in the email to the shell, uh, you know, called attention um, to the last paragraph on the first page, which has a sec second sentence, which reads, we intend to reduce the number of students who require special education reading services in grade three and beyond after implementing a research-based early literacy program. Um, and um, you know, my understanding of the way in which we operate is that we, you know, put programs or methodologies in place, you know, and then we monitor those things to see if we have in fact achieved the expected results and then we adjust. And the way that this is written, or at least you know, the way it struck me as I read it, it says that, oh, we already know what's going to happen. So therefore, we're definitely doing this. Um, and so I'm hoping that you'll say that, oh, yeah, this isn't really the way we want to phrase how we are actually operating, that it, it should read much more, you know, spiritually in the sense of a feedback loop. And uh, in, if our expectations are realized, this would be an outcome, but this is not um, anything that's locked in. Um, and, and then I also want to um, join with my colleagues in saying that these literacy skills, you know, are foundational to people's lives. Um, and we need to make sure that we provide support, you know, as long as we have students in the district, you know, um, through their senior year of high school, you know, helping to make sure that we have provided them with the strongest literacy background that we can. I just want to also echo uh, what Diane said in that uh, I think what this document misses is the intersectionality between special education and foundational reading. I, there's two different things here, right? So we are disenfranchising all of our kids <laughs> by not having foundational reading services in place, and we are addressing that. And as Diane congratulated Deb, I totally agree. Like, finally, we have a structure in place to address that. But it doesn't ignore the fact that even with foundational services in place, we still are going to have a significant population of students that are going to qualify for special education because they are indeed dyslexic. And so they may require services beyond that and, and, and aren't currently, and I can speak from personal experience, being serviced by what is going on in our district at the moment. And so even though this document speaks to K through two and what we will have put in place as far as assessment and screening and all of that, in two years, that, that's fine, but we have kids right now in second grade and first grade. And, you know, hopefully some of those things are starting to be implemented, but, you know, we have kids in third grade and fourth grade and fifth grade, and even kids in seventh grade who are still far behind their peers, and it is reflected in an MCAS result. So, um, you know, I, I hate the MCAS as, as the measure of what we're doing, but I understand that, you know, that, that that's a metric that, that we're using here. And, you know, I, I pulled the students with disabilities uh, numbers from 2017 to 2019. And, you know, although we've made improvements, we're still far, far behind where, they're, if you just look at like white students that don't fall into any of the other categories, they're, they're still way behind. And that's, you know, I just, I agree with Diane. I, I don't think that this can, can go by without adding students with disabilities to, um, to this. Uh, Yevin? Uh, thank you, Tessa. So just a quick, for out of curiosity, so how many students is gonna this program impact, and I mean, how many students are gonna be benefiting from this, and then, and how many students is below the? So here, so I'm reading the student sub subgroup which require focused support to ensure all students achieve at high levels. So that means so. I just wonder how many students in the district are at lower level. Basically, I just wanted to know this program, how many, so probably we have say 100 students are not at high level, but by doing this program, we, we impact how many? Yeah, do you wanna? 
answer that. So I just got kicked off and came back on again. Oh. So I just need to, I just need to him to repeat. So, uh, may, okay. So Deb froze again. So, you know, I don't either Dawn, you can jump in or I'll, I'll try to jump in, but, but I know Deb had looked a lot. Of I, think, I think the goal overall, you know, the very first thing that we have to look at when we're talking about systems of support is the, the tier one instruction and what's happening in our general education classrooms. And so, you know, ultimately, Yevon, the, I guess the answer is that it would impact every student in early childhood because the you know once we get in and implement all of the practices and the screeners and other pieces um, that you know ultimately it's going to improve instruction for all of the students in those grades. I'm sorry, I got um, kicked off the internet. <laughs> Thank you, Don. So yeah, but I I think you know. The goal, uh, you know, we have about right now as a district, we, you know, you can see in our demographics overall as a district what the breakdown is in terms of um, population by some of the subgroups listed, um, you know, for Black, Hispanic, Latino, you know, students who are economically disadvantaged, that's all available. And those are three of the targets that, um, you know, we think that you, you know, we want to impact. We've heard clearly that we want to add students with disabilities to this. Um, and we, we probably will look at uh, English learners as well, because they're actually the next in line of, in terms of, you know, disproportionately impacted by the literacy program. Um, but, you know, in terms of students with disabilities, we have about 116 students right now diagnosed, you know, specific learning disability and about 116 diagnosed with communication uh, disabilities. Um, one of the challenges right now is we're over-diagnosing some of the communication disabilities and under-diagnosing the specific learning disability, um, and in particular around the area of reading. And that's something that, that Debbie's been talking about um, for a little while, and she's she's working on with our special educators. So we don't have the exact number of students with disabilities because it's not clean right now in our data system. So, you know, but what we do know is the vast majority of students diagnosed with specific learning disabilities are in the area of reading. Yeah, I just wanted to know actually, basically we would like to have a program which covers actually pretty much all the students which needed to say, achieve at high level, right? Needed to improve. Yeah, and I, I think one of the challenges of what the Student Opportunity Act is asking for is it's asking us to very specifically identify subgroups of students that we want to impact with this. Um, you know, we know and we believe that the literacy program is going to actually benefit all of our students, but we have to actually identify the students that we think need the most support um, and make sure we're targeting the resources to that. Thank you. Okay. Jenny and John, I assume your hands are still up because you didn't put them down. Am I right? <laughs> okay. All right. So if anyone has additional comments, uh, send them to Peter. And do you want them to copy Beth? I don't know. Just you. Uh, it would be great, actually, to copy Beth because I get such a volume of emails that she helps sort that through. Um, and again, you know, for people who are here that would like to comment on it as well, if you email Beth Petter, um, you know, and then you can copy me, that will allow us to take that feedback in and use it. Excellent. Okay. The next item on our agenda is a consent agenda. Um, so items on the consent agenda do not usually require discussion and are approved with one vote unless any member would like to hold an item for discussion in a separate vote. I will read each item name and if any member would like it held, please say hold. So the first item is the approval of meeting minutes of 12-17-2020 and also 12-23 of 2020. And the second item is approval of a $4,000 donation from the Friends of the Acton Libraries to the eight school libraries of the Acton Boxborough Regional School District. All right, and I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve with gratitude. Second. 
Okay. We will do a roll call vote. Uh, John. Yes. Jenny. Jenny. Uh, yes. Yevin. Yes. Diane. Yes. Kira. Yes. Adam. Yes. Nora. Yes. Amy. Yes. Angie. Yes. Evelyn. Yes. And myself. Yes. All right. That passes unanimously. Okay. Um, the next thing is me. I have like 10 things of paper. Sorry. Different piles. So the next thing is um, our FY21 operating protocols. Um, I believe that it was at our um, workshop with Tony Bent that we did a little bit of work at looking at our operating protocols. And so we went back and included some of the feedback from that workshop into the protocols, which you found in your packet. Um, we did it, uh, there was track changes, so you can see what the changes were. Um, but, but the main changes, just to bring them to everybody's um, attention, were in the first paragraph under supporting the educational welfare and well-being of all students in a positive district and climate. There was two items that we changed. It says create policies, develop bu budgets, and assure administrative accountability to ensure <laughs> administrative accountability to sustain continuous improvement in teaching and learning. And the second one, second, third bullet was support the superintendent and staff and hold them accountable for their implementation of policies and operations that are inclusive and equitable. The other change was under where we dedicate ourselves to establishing and maintaining effective communication. The second bullet now says welcome respectful, thoughtful, thoughtful input from the public and the school committee in shaping committee decisions. Um, I think the only other change was adding a bullet and then changing the names to reflect the members of the committee this year. So I don't know if there's additional discussion or if those sound good and people want to um, approve them as is. Uh, I'm gonna say move to approve. Second. Adam, did you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, you know, I, I thought about some of the, the things that we've been dealing with, with um, with the Zoom bombing, with some of the, the, the racist comments that have been directed towards our committee members. And I, I wanted to pause just for a moment and wonder if there's something that we should add to these protocols. And as I was thinking about that, I also looked at the date when these were last voted. Typically these are voted right at the beginning of the year and here we are in the middle of the year already. Um, and so I'm, I'm also cognizant of the fact that we wanna codify these and have them available for us to refer to, but I don't want this moment to go by without recognizing the fact that when we do this work next time, we need to put more um, commitment in our protocols about how we will um, identify that systemic racism exists in our towns and that we there's work for us to do as a committee in, in the protocols that we um, adhere to in running a meeting that, um, would identify that that exists and that we need to, that there's work to do to eliminate it. So Adam, I'm not opposed at all to, to holding these and, and doing the work to add them. I think I would just ask if there's one or two committee members that would want to take that on um, and then and then bring it back. Um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to waiting at all. I don't think that there's any rush to codifying these. I mean, I think that this is, this committee has been sort of working through these, working by these standards um, this year and anyway. But uh, I agree with you that I think that, that that things have certainly maybe not changed, but we've we've uh, gained a greater awareness. And so I think that it's totally appropriate to reflect that in our protocols, um, especially if, if if the committee feels that way. So um, I'll throw that out there if there if there's um, you know one or two or even three people that want to sit down and and, and um, come up with some things that would strengthen our protocols to better reflect um, the things that that we've been facing and, and the decisions that we've made as a committee and the, the statement that we agreed to and and um, voted on at our last meeting. I don't know. 
I, I'm, I'm totally open to that. If, I'm, if I'm happy to, to help facilitate that work, um, particularly if, if Amy will withdraw her motion to approve. Yes, I, will. I, I agree with you, Adam. You make a good point. So I would like to withdraw my motion. I'm going to withdraw my second, too. Thank you, Adam. Nora, what did you say? I'm sorry. Um, I was just saying I'd be happy to work on that as well, um, maybe integrating some of the statement that we wrote together as a committee. Great. All right. Are we good with that? You can just nod if you think it's okay. So if anyone has some thoughts, they can email those to um, Adam. And um, and then you and Nora can work together. And um, to avoid any quorum, just if you have a comment, send it to Adam alone and he will take care of, um, you know, working, working with Nora on that. And then they'll send it back to me and Peter and we'll bring it to a future meeting. Okay? Sweet. Nice job. Okay. <laughs> wow, how did superintendent goals get all the way down this far <laughs> on the agenda? This is the last big thing that I think we have, but um, although there is a budget update. So, Peter, you're uh, up. <laughs> so, you know, superintendent goals, uh, you know, hopefully you've had an opportunity to review because I think these have been <laughs> in the packet for a month now um, for approval. So, you know, if you remember, um, Back on December 3rd, we actually, you know, shared some initial thoughts around goals um, for my evaluation for the year. You gave me a significant amount of feedback about that. And, you know, in the memo, I outlined three areas that I, I tried to listen to how to bring together kind of 11 different sets of feedback um, into some actionable ways that I could, you know, refine these goals. So, you know, three things that I did. One is provide an overarching purpose or rationale for the goals uh, to align with corresponding district objectives in our strategy that you know we're, we're gonna be finalizing this year. A second area was incorporating the action steps that I'm gonna be taking, um, as well as the evidence of completion that you should expect to see. Um, and then the third one is adding an additional goal in support of our third strategic objective, equitable opportunities and outcomes to reflect work that we're actually already doing this year. Um, but I think in terms of raising the level of import of that work, so, um, the rest is there and, you know, this is for your action tonight. Anyone have something they wanted to share or comment or feedback or emotion? I move to uh, approve the superintendent goals as provided in the packet. Second. Uh, Diane, were you raising your hand to make that motion or because you have something to share? So um, I just had a, a quick question, um, if you don't mind, sorry, um, about just with goal two and it's, it's the, it's the second to last, um, row in the table under increasing the number of certified staff who are black, Latinx and Asian. And then the goal is 10% of newly hired staff will be black, Latinx or Asian. Or agent. Uh, all I really want is just clarity um, around because I know we have this as a goal and we met the goal and I think it might have been two years ago now, and and I don't know what is the status of of this um, so, initiative. Yeah. So you know this is going to be an ongoing initiative for for a long time. Um, you know I think one of the things we thought about this year is um, originally when we had it we said we were going to increase the diversity of our workforce by 20 percent i think that's how we had phrased the goal a couple of years ago um the i really thought about this year in particular um that that may not be an appropriate metric anymore for this year and the reason being um a that's like a long-term metric as opposed to a short-term metric um it's going to take us years to increase by overall by 20 percent but the other element of it is it assumes that we're going to have a certain level of staff turnover in any given year. Um, and I wanted to write the goal that could be more responsive to whatever level of staff turnover we have. Um, it's very possible this year that we're going to be hiring far fewer staff members than we've hired in, in recent years. And the reason I say that is we actually already added, you know, we've hired 20 new staff members this year. Uh, many of them on, and I believe that's 20 on one-year contracts because of the pandemic uh, to staff our remote learning program, to backfill 
our schools um, for teaching positions that went to the remote learning program. Um, and so, you know, if we are hiring staff, we have a number of staff this year who have done exceptional jobs for us coming in. Um, and we've had now actually been able to observe them do their work for a year. It's very possible that if we have vacancies, we might be able to keep some of the staff we've hired. It's going to be hard to increase the diversity of our workforce if, in fact, that's the case, um, where we're retaining really some of the top teachers we've hired. So instead, what I wanted to think about is, okay, if we have a certain number of open positions, say we have 10 open positions, then we want to make sure, you know, our goal is about 10%. So we want it for every 10 positions we have open, it allows us to think about growing the target, I guess, so to speak, of what we're trying to bring on board. Is that, is that? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. John, did you have your hand up or was that from before when you made a motion? You're good. Okay. Evelyn? Yeah, so, Peter, thank you for um, incorporating all that feedback from 11 people into your goals. I appreciate it. But as I was looking at the goals, and I was thinking if I should say something, but I'm going to just put it out there. I do, I worry, just given everything that is going on with COVID, how realistic is it that you're going to meet all these goals? And I almost feel like your biggest goal this year is getting school from start to finish and and i know you know these are ambitious goals and they're not easy to accomplish and i worry that you just have your hands full with the pandemic and and managing the school the kids the staff everything that you have going how realistic is it going to be for you because i don't want what i don't want to Unless maybe some of these are already in the process and they're ongoing, um, I don't want us to get to the end of the year and and say, oh, we, you know, you didn't have the time to do X, Y, and Z and accomplish these goals. And we know very well that you have your hands full dealing with other situations. And I almost think should we think about scaling them down to something that is reasonable and and. Um, accomplishable instead of, you know, what we have right now. But it's your prerogative. I just wanted to put it out there and see what your thoughts were around that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I can tell you just about everything we chose was work that was actually in pro progress. Um, you know, I'll be honest, I don't know whether we'll get to all of it. Um, I think that was one thing I was thinking of as I was trying to incorporate all the feedback um, from the last meeting was, you know, are we going to actually get to everything here? Um, I can't tell you that, but it doesn't mean that I don't think it's going to still be, you know, worthwhile to try and work for it, if that, that makes sense. So, you know, I, I have always said that, you know, I, I always value educator goals and, you know, for, for people I work with that um, might be a bit on the ambitious side with an acknowledgement that they may not get met the goal, but significant progress toward the goal is just as good as meeting the goal um, often. So, you know, I, I can't tell you that I don't have a level of anxiety over that myself, um, but I also kind of have a knowledge that if we don't pass these soon, it's going to end up being May before <laughs> we have goals. Um, so I, I appreciate that, though. John? So I also have some uh, concerns about superintendent burnout because, you know, just like all the rest of educator burnout, that's not a, a good path to go down. Uh, having said that, there's a lot of uh, research on the psychology of goal setting, and it all argues that um, you it, it's very important to set goals beyond what you can expect to accomplish and that nominally, you know, a good goal, uh, you know, if you're, you're pretty successful, you should get about 80% of the way there. Um, so, you know, my view of this, and I think this is in your cover letter, um, is that, um, you know, the, you don't expect to get 100%. If you really thought there was much of a chance you could get to 100%, I would say these goals simply aren't ambitious enough. And, and that actually, I wanted to make the point that this isn't just related to you and your goals. You know, this is related to educators and their goals, and of course, to students and their goals. You know, we want to set the bar a little bit beyond 
you know, where we think they can get to, and then they're going to get how far they get. And then we're all going to say, great, you know, victory, this was a wonderful accomplishment, and we're going to move on and do it all over again. And so the psychology of it, you know, like I said, it, there's been a lot of work that's been done, and, and that's the right way to do it. And, you know, it feels a little uncomfortable, and, you know, people are actually structured differently, but um, I, I think it's fine to have these goals, you know, and if at the end of the year, we say you got 75, 85% of the way there, we'll have a party and life will go on. Let's go. John? Yes. Diane? Yes. Evelyn? Yes. Nora? Yes. Kira? Yes. Adam? Yes. Jenny? Yes. Amy? Yes. Angie? Yes. Yevon? Yes. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Peter, for incorporating the uh, comments. And myself, yes. Okay. All right, those pass unanimously. Thank you, Evan. Uh, thank you, Peter, for, for writing them. And so your mid-year update will be at the next meeting, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to look at that schedule, I think. <laughs> right. Okay. Budget update. Dave? Thanks, um, Tessa. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have any material from me, and I'm not planning anything other than just that budget season's underway, and we're processing the requests, and in the middle of putting together the first presentation, which will be at the next meeting. Um, and I think that that what was on our agenda, and maybe Adam wants to speak to it, is the reserves policy. So, Adam, you want to chime in with that? Yeah, so in our packet this evening, um, we put in a copy of the reserves policy DK, which was um, voted uh, just back in May of 2019. Um, we wanted to review this and we, we reviewed this policy both in the budget subcommittee, but also wanted to bring it to the committee as a whole, um, because we know that in these difficult times, uh, we may be looking at um, additional use of our reserves, the excess and deficiency fund, um, to help uh, reduce some of the burden on our um, our uh, communities. Um, so there were a couple things that I wanted to highlight in this um, because uh, while there are some some physical or, or, or hard numbers in here, there's also some language in here that I wanted to point out to the committee and, and give anybody else an opportunity just to, to make a comment here. Um, what sticks out, first of all, is that um, uh, by statute, we're no law, we're not allowed to have more than five percent of our operating budget held in reserves. Um, and when we uh, put this policy in place in 2019, we said that um, the committee recommends that we target our reserve between four and four and a half percent. And Dave has made many comments about um, landing the uh, the airplane on the aircraft carrier in terms of coming in on our budget numbers. Um, and and so four and four and a half percent is a bit of a tight. Um, range for us to hit. And we know that we'll be, uh, like I said, uh, potentially tapping those reserves for some of the um, uses that we list in this uh, this policy one-time expenses. Um, and so just wanted to, to uh, bring this up again, that it's a recommendation for a target level of, of funds in our reserve. And uh, if asked, Dave would be happy at some point later to share what our reserves have looked like in the past. We've done an excellent job of building up our reserves over the past five or so years. Um, and the point of the reserves, as I think most of the, the folks on the budget subcommittee agreed, um, were to be able to have a reserve for uh, times very similar to what we're looking at now, where, where we may need to be lean and we may need to still fund some of the, the operations of the district. So I'll leave it with uh, leave it at that and, and uh, see if there's anybody else who wants to make a comment. Dave? Just a clarification, and Adam, I know you know this and probably the committee does too, but when you talk about reserves, plural, and the statutory limit, that applies just to e &D. So the, there are other reserves. We have the Capital Stabilization Fund and Circuit Breaker, I consider a reserve, but the 5% the cap is specifically to e and Thanks, Steve. Diane? Just a quick um, comment to, for Adam. Um, so I feel like you're setting us up for like a big ask, like right on the cusp of budget season. And um, I just would ask uh, that um, if there's going to be a big ask, that there be also a plan for replenishing. Yeah, I mean, we've not seen the budget information yet. That's what comes at the next meeting, Diane. Um, but it, it, it's definitely something that 
I think we're preempting only because we've heard a lot of people talk about the fact that, oh my gosh, our certified E&D is below our requirement of 4%. And just, you know, as we start to talk about this, we want to remind the committee and, and the community that it is not a requirement, it's a recommended target. Okay, we're good? All right, um, subcommittee and member reports. I don't know if I have anything specific that anybody wants to speak to. Um, the, the PTO roundtable meets on Monday, so we haven't met yet. I don't know the policy. Had any, to be, had any, well, no, have? but we just to announce that we are meeting Friday the 15th at 8.30 in the morning. Adam? Yeah, so budget will be meeting uh, this coming Monday. Um, and also, I was going to give an update on the building committee uh, and the building project, but Peter did an excellent job of uh, recapping that in his superintendent's update. So thanks, Sorry, Peter. Adam. It's all right. Took me off the hot seat. All right. Was there anyone else? So, so we'll, we'll provide more time at the next meeting for any subcommittee member reports because it sounds like we haven't had very, very many meetings given the vacation and everything else. So... I have the warrants in front of me, so I can read them unless you want to, Adam. No. <laughs> Are you raising your hand for something else, or is it still up? No. Okay. Good. All right. So tonight we have um, the the warrants motion language is found at the end of today's memo. I move that the school committee vote to approve payroll warrants as follows: number P two one one three, dated twelve seventeen twenty twenty, in the amount of two million seven hundred twenty thousand seven dollars and seventy nine cents. Number P2114, dated 1231-2020, in the amount of $2,620,914.96. Payroll deduction warrants as follows. Number 21-013PR, dated 1217-2020, in the amount of $588,163.79. Number 21-014PR, dated 1231-2020, in the amount of one million three hundred. $52,772.72. Vendor warrants as follows. Number 21-013, dated 12-24-2020, in the amount of $1,542,913.62. And student activity warrants as follows. Number 21-013-SH, dated 12-24-2020, in the amount of $12,797.51. Is there a second? Second. All right, Adam? Yes. Diane? Yes. Evelyn? Yes. John? Yes. Kira? Yes. Nora? Yes. Jenny? Yes. Amy? Yes. Angie? Yes. Kevin? Yes. And myself? Yes. And the Warren Subcommittee, I just want to remind you to check your emails for when... <laughs> Uh, Becky sends those out because it's always like me and John. So everybody, everybody, please check your emails so that you remember to respond to her. Uh, and Tessa, can I can I note that I was very thankful to you know my fellow subcommittee members you know who were willing to engage in a small amount of humor so that you know while we're still not reading poems during the regular meeting, at least you know in email there's a certain amount of levity. Poor John. All right, Peter. Is there anything in the FYI that you wanted to highlight? Let's see. You know, just I, I think, you know, a, there's a donation in there. Uh, the election, I was just going to say, is coming up. Uh, okay. So there's information on, you know, pulling papers in the election calendar, things like that. Um, and then there's another round of QPR trainings. Um, and there's a flyer in there for if, if folks are interested in that. Great. Our next meetings are January 21st and February 4th, and I will entertain um, uh, to adjourn. second. I'll note that budget Saturday was previously scheduled for January 23rd and is canceled. So because of the schedule of everything this year, so January 21st, we're talking budget. Yes, that's the big thing. Okay. All right. Uh, Adam. Yes. Diane. Yes. Evelyn. Yes. John. Yes. Kira. Yes. Nora. Yes. Jenny, you made it <laughs> all the way to the end. <laughs> Your vote. 
Are you moving to are you? Yes. I said yes. Oh, sorry, Amy. Yes. Angie. Yes. Gavin. Yes. And myself. Yes. And look, see, it's before ten o'clock. Not so bad.